10, 9, ignition sequence. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Just one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. One, zero, and lift off. Our mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and it's come to a final stop. This is Jay Estes. I'm a deputy for flight test integration in the Orion program. What you see here is a Delta IV heavy booster being launched from the pad. This is a flight test that Orion's going to conduct in 2014. It's a Delta IV heavy unmanned booster with two strap-on boosters on the side. Once we get through first stage, the strap-on boosters separate themselves and the central core continues on as a second stage. Once we get to low Earth orbit, the second stage shuts down and separates itself from the spacecraft and the upper stage. At that point, the upper stage lights and takes us onto orbit, and the service module panels separate, and then the launch abort system with its shroud, which has been covering the, the capsule, comes off. In low Earth orbit, which is about 250 miles above the surface of the Earth, we make one orbit, and this orbit lets us check out our systems. After one orbit, we ignite the upper stage and we lift the orbit to about 3,600 miles. Now, 3,600 miles is approximately 10 times higher than any man-rated spaceship has been since 1972 when we came back from the moon. And the reason we're doing this is to test our heat shield on entry. The heat shield will be exposed to uh, heating much like you would get from the moon. And uh, we'll be able to demonstrate that our heat shield is sufficient for recovering people from missions beyond Earth. And as we begin to enter, the capsule then separates from the service module section. The service module section stays attached to the upper stage. And here you see control jets that are firing to control the attitude for entry. And as we enter, we experience the maximum heating lower in the atmosphere. And this is a primary test of Exploration Flight Test 1, is that heat shield. As we get low in the atmosphere, the forward bay cover comes off, which covers the parachutes. And two small chutes come out to slow us down. And after we slow down, those separate. Three small pilot chutes come out to open three main parachutes, which initially open at about 3% opening. Then they go to 10% open, and then they go to full open. We use those staging to keep the forces on the chutes lower. It makes for a softer ride, and it keeps our chutes safe. We enter the water at a slight angle to help the crew with the impact to the water. The parachutes fall in the water. We hope to recover those. And we're cooperating with the Navy, and we're using one of their well deck ships uh, to recover our capsule. And this Orion, after this space flight, will be refurbished and used again on an ascent abort test in the future. Hi, I'm Trim Parado, Public Affairs Officer at NASA Headquarters. Welcome to today's NASA social media chat for the Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle. We had a great event this morning here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida to recognize the arrival of the first space-bound Orion spacecraft, the one right behind me. Uh, we're excited to have this opportunity to answer your questions at home about America's next generation spacecraft that will carry astronauts farther into space than ever before. Uh, we've had a lot of great questions come in so far this morning on the comment threads of uh, NASA's Facebook and Google Plus pages. For those of you following on Twitter, you can ask your questions to the panelists by using the hashtag AskNASA, excuse me, AskNASA, and we'll get to as many as we can over the next 45 minutes. Uh, the space-bound Orion behind me uh, will launch on Exploration Flight Test 1, an uncrewed mission planned for 2014. Uh, this will travel 3,600 miles above the Earth's surface, 15 times farther than the International Space Station's current orbital position. This is farther than any human spacecraft has gone in more than 40 years. Uh, this flight will help prove that Orion can survive the enormous speeds and heat 
generated during a return from deep space. We have a distinguished panel of participants here to answer your questions about the spacecraft, the 2014 EFT-1 flight, and the future missions Orion, the space launch system and development will enable. I'd like to introduce them now. First, we have Mark Geyer. He is NASA's program manager for Orion. Uh, essentially, he's the person managing the huge effort at NASA that's uh, building and delivering the spacecraft that you see behind us and the team that'll turn it into a fully operational spacecraft. Uh, next, we have David Beeman, the NASA Space Launch System Spacecraft and Payload Integration Manager. Uh, he's part of the team working on America's next heavy lift rocket. It's going to provide an entirely new capability for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, for more information about SLS, uh, you can get all the facts at nasa.gov slash SLS. Next, we have Pepper Phillips, uh, the NASA Ground Systems Development and Operations Program Manager. Uh, ground Systems here at Kennedy is leading the transformation of this launch complex to a next generation spaceport, bustling with government and commercial activity. And next, we have astronaut Rex Walheim. He's the astronaut office's main liaison with the Orion program. In that capacity, he provides input from his unique perspective as an astronaut throughout Orion's design and testing process. He's a veteran of three space shuttle flights. This includes being one of the four NASA astronauts to fly on the final shuttle mission, STS-135, nearly a year ago. So, we're going to jump right into your questions, uh, and we've monitored quite a few that came in this morning. I'm going to take the moderator's privilege and ask the first one if that's okay, because I, I, I'm guessing it's on your minds at home, too. And it's Mark Geyer. Why is your spacecraft green? Uh, I had that same question a, a few years ago. Basically, it's a coating. It's a primer. Uh, you can think of if you had a car or other metal pieces, you like to put a primer on it. Protects it against corrosion and other things. Uh, it'll be covered. So when we fly, you won't see uh, the green. We're actually going to have uh, uh, tiles on the back shield that it will be black. Um, part of that is uh, part of the thermal protection that we use uh, as Orion comes back in. And the heat shield itself on the bottom will be white. So all of that has to do with uh, understanding what uh, how, how we want the thermal properties to behave, and then what coatings we're certifying for flight. Okay, all right. So the first question we're going to take from the public comes to us from Facebook, and it's what makes the Orion capsule suited for deep space exploration? Would ever like to take that? Start. A um, couple things. Because of the long duration that it's going to have, and we have four people, four people are the mission that we have. So the longer you're out in space, the more stuff you need food, water, um, also the crew requires suits and other things. Uh, longer duration will actually require uh, a toilet, those kind of things. So that, that increases the volume. So the volume is bigger, uh, the longer duration the crew is going to be out because, again, the stuff that they need uh, to survive. Uh, also, long duration missions require, or the uh, d missions further from the planet require more propulsion tanks, so forth. So. The Delta V we use to get us around, drive the size of Orion as well. Um, there's a lot of things that you don't see in the structure that uh, would be in the avionics, the computers, and other things. As you get further and further from Earth, you want your reliability. Uh, quality is much more important because failures and issues a long way from Earth are a lot harder uh, to recover from. So those are the kind of things I think are big drivers for us. Um, Radiation shielding is another one. Uh, this structure, of course, is a big part of that. And there are other things we do for the crew when they're a long way from Earth to protect them for that. Got it. Did Rex, did you want to? OK, OK. Well, well let me go. Uh, let me ask a, a related question, actually, for, for Rex. And it's something that I saw on Facebook this morning, too. Um, and, and you, you des described how the spacecraft will function and, and some of the considerations we need to make. But a more pointed question, how will astronauts be able to maintain muscle mass and bone density aboard Orion? How are we preparing for? Be a lot, it'd be fairly similar to what we do on the, in the International Space Station. We'll have resistive devices and then potentially some kind of ergonomic device. And it's, it's very important, and that's one of the most important things we're learning from the space station is how to survive in space, how the human body can withstand six months, a year possibly, and even, even longer. And so what we're learning on space station, we've, we've developed some effective countermeasures of how to stay in shape, how to, how to maintain your muscle mass, and we'll incorporate those lessons into this vehicle. All right, next question. Um, any plans to make Orion compatible with the International Space Station docks in case of an emergency need to dock? Uh, part of our plan is to be a potentially a backup uh, in the unlikely case that maybe the commercial crew guys uh, are not able to perform that function. So 
Uh, it turns out a lot of the Orion requirements are the same. Uh, we're, we have the capability to dock. Uh, we can carry people. We have the propulsion capability to do that. Um, so we would just they would need they would give us need to give us a, you know a couple years to to uh, change our plans to put some things like a rendezvous and docking sensor on Orion, which of course we have the capability to do. So we can do it. But I think the way you said it is right as a backup, because uh, really it's built for exploration. It's as we talked about, it's bigger because of exploration. So it's not as an efficient uh, an ISS transport vehicle. But we we can be ready as needed as if we need to be called up. Okay. Um, direct this question to uh, to Pepper and to, to David. Um, what what sorts of challenges, technical communication, you know, et cetera, Essentially, as, as we as we look to, to send astronauts to and from deep space here from Kennedy, how, how do you have to approach that differently than you've ever done before as you prepare SLS to launch from here, as you prepare ground systems to, to be able to support SLS? What's, what's different this time around when you're, when you're looking at a farther target, like somewhere in deep space? Okay, well, I, I think we have some experience in, in going to the moon, and, we t and we're going to take advantage of that. You know, one of the biggest challenges that you have is, is having good, safe, and reliable access to deep space. Um, you talked about the physical aspects, making sure that the health of, of the astronauts, um, you have to have redundancy. You have to make sure that if you put a crew out there, you have the ability to get it back. Part of that is the launch vehicle, and part of that is the spacecraft itself. So, you know, it, it drives our design time, it drives our test time, and we want to make sure that we have the safest, most reliable system out there. And for us, for the ground, it's much like uh, we, we're, our processing is just like we do for shuttle or any of the other spacecraft we've launched from here. Our job is, if there's going to be a failure, let it be on the ground. Reliability is a big deal for these guys. We want to make sure the testing, the checkout, the things that are we look at on the ground are complete satisfy the criteria that the designers designed the vehicles to, and then we're ready to go. Okay. Um, next question came in from Twitter. What is the predicted date of an Orion manned space flight? And actually, I, you know, can you give us a little more detail on it, what, what it is that we're looking forward to? Yeah, good. Um, so we have this flight test first in 2014. We have an abort flight test that'll be, that we're working on the date, probably around the 2017 time frame. That'll be done out of Florida. Uh, our first big test with SLS will be in 2017. It'll be unmanned because we want to flesh out the systems, the integration with the rocket um, unmanned before we actually put people on board. So those have to happen first. Um, and then we have a lot of tests on the ground to qualify, ECLIS, displacing controls, other things, seats that are part of launching people. So beyond 17, that data is really driven by, by the budget. Uh, we're working with headquarters on exactly what the budget's going to be. It's a, little, it's a few years out. Today we're projecting uh, probably in the 2021 time frame. I believe we can do better than that, and that's what we're trying to work, accelerating those dates. Okay. All right. Let's see. For, uh, we'll do it for David. Uh, question from Twitter. Um, your SLS is going to take us to, to deep space, carry the Orion spacecraft there. How much farther outside Earth's orbit is that? Where, what's, your, what's your line? Where, where's your, where are you aiming? What's the, what's the boundary for you? Uh, well, obviously, I think, you know, the first goal is to go around the moon with the first two early missions, and, and we'd like to have a, a manned Mars mission. Um, a lot of discussion about going to an asteroid. Uh, that's one potential, but, you know, I think near term, we want to repeat uh, the success we had previously going to the moon. We want to make sure we provide Orion with the, the test flights that they need to prove the deep space capability, and then really, you know, the planets, the stars are the limit. So, so we know space starts about 100 kilometers. There, is there a, a, a measure when you're, when you're talking deep space? Is there a certain kilometer measure that you're using? Say, SLS needs to get us this far. I really don't think that because I think relatively speaking, that's a whole lot closer than we want to go. You know, when we talk deep space, we're talking Mars, we're talking an asteroid. And I think the, the dividing line between, you know, uh, a low Earth orbit and deep space, I think, is a whole lot closer than we want to get as an agency. All right. Uh, here's a, a fairly technical question from, from Facebook. Uh, will the service module be adapted to carry mission-specific payloads, such as planetary science, Earth's observation, or astronomy instruments? So from the beginning, we designed the service module to have cargo-carrying cargo capability. Um, 
with a, a two tank configuration, so depending on what uh, propulsion delta V you think you need, we can actually carry quite large payloads. Uh, in the four full tank configuration, like the one we're sending on uh, our flight tests around the moon, we have a uh, we still have volume that can either be um, attached to the side of the service module or actually could be areas that we could extract from the bottom. So we are looking at that very closely because I think it's extremely important uh, to be able to have uh, payload capability, experiment capability. Since we're going to these far places, uh, those payloads will actually give us a lot of capability to understand um, the planet. Uh, just a reminder for those of you watching at home, if you're on Twitter, you can ask your questions of the panelists by using the hashtag AskNASA. If you're on Google Plus and Facebook, just lo uh, look for the comment thread that we have going and, and put your question there. We have a team uh, getting us the questions just as, as quick as you're putting them in. So the next one comes from Twitter, and that's, uh, it could be Mark, could be Rex. It's an interesting one. Why, why did the shuttle fly a manned first test flight, and why are we planning an uncrewed test of the Orion capsule first? on the capabilities of the system you're developing. What you'd like to do is you, if you have the ability to test something unmanned, it's the safest way to do it. And so uh, with the shuttle, they, they deemed as it got closer to launch that having the presence of people on board was the best way to do it. They couldn't automate the, uh, the landing sequence uh, in time to be able to put people on, to, to be able to do it uh, automated for the first flight. Uh, so it took a lot of guts and uh, courage to send those two guys, John Young and Bob Crippen, on that first flight in a manned configuration. But if you can test these out unmanned and automated capability first, uh, that's the way you want to go. Anything to add? Mark? Okay. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. Uh, what scientific fields will be necessary for deep space human exploration? What do you have to learn now scientifically that's going to enable human travel? Uh, Rex has actually been up there, so why don't you start with that? Okay, for what kind of uh, field you need to be, you might want to have on a deep space mission? Well, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, from a uh, from the low Earth orbit, we were building the space station. We needed, and we're operating the space station. You, you have a, a wide variety of backgrounds, uh, from uh, engineers to scientists to pilots. You can have the same kind of core background for deep space missions, but you're also going to need a more heavily uh, geology-based uh, uh, field of knowledge or, or, or training. And so we're actually looking at that in the astronaut office. We're training uh, our astronauts to be better geologists. We've, we're looking at pro, uh, prototype programs. And we did that in the Apollo program. We're going to have to get back to that because uh, the really important thing about uh, about manned spaceflight is you have curiosity. You have a, a knowledge base they have when they get there, and they have a curiosity when they get there. Uh, they can be trained all about geology and told, okay, this is where we want to look at. But when they look to the side a little bit and see something different, they say, huh, that's odd. Those are where some of your best discoveries come from. So we'll, we'll try to have a little uh, broader uh, training in geology and some of the planetary sciences, and I think that'll, uh, that'll help us out a lot. And I think I've seen a lot of the um, technology that we need to send people further in space. We're learning a lot on space stations. So the long duration, you, you, we, a great question on the bone mass and other things, which was a huge uncertainty until space station, where we've learned a lot about what exercise equipment can do and help. Radiation is another one. We, we understand what the environment is like. How can we protect the crew better? What are the real effects? That's another one that we're, I think we're pushing the envelope on. Two good examples. So, so David, how about on the, on the SLS side? And this is a sort of related question from, from Twitter. What, what innovations do you have to do on your end to sustain human uh, life as, as, as we go out into deep space? How are you designing the launch vehicle with that in mind? What innovations do you need to make? Okay, I, and I think there's a, a couple of areas that we have to cover. You have to have a large enough launch vehicle to send the supplies, to send the spacecraft, and, and other things that you'll need to be able to sustain that. So, so we have to build this. Um, we have to build it smart. We have to build a vehicle that will allow us to put the payloads, the cargo, and, and the spacecraft in space uh, to the location that's desired and have the ability to provide the supplies for that long-term uh, duration. Um, as I spoke earlier, most important thing is safety. Safety is paramount. And, and a lot of times safety not only drives our cost but drives our mass. Um, we need to do things smart. We need to decide when enough is enough. We need to design something that will meet our needs, but we don't need to try to design the perfect vehicle because we'll never get there. So. Okay. Let's see. This question. Uh, I'm going to actually ask this of all, of all four of you. Um, what is the core purpose? This comes from Facebook. What is the core purpose of this exploration for humanity? Why are we doing it? 
why are we why are we building why are each of you you know get, making the sacrifices you are building your career around this this goal of deep space exploration why do we do it well for me i think exploration is a desire that's it's in the human heart people want to explore and i think uh, true exploration takes the government it, it takes the resources of a government to do true exploration from the time of lewis and clark when president jefferson said we want to send you guys out to do exploration to find a way to the pacific ocean he didn't say go there and you know set up some shops and make some money. It was true exploration. We didn't know what we didn't know. We found, and then when he sent them out, we found new kinds of plants, new kinds of animals, and we were better as a country for that. I think the same thing holds true with space exploration. We don't know what we don't know, and when we find those things and we make those discoveries, we're going to be better off just as a people, but also it's going to have applications that help make our life better. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I think also when you look at the uh, some of the more near term, or I'd say uh, not too far from Earth discoveries like going to Mars and looking at whether there's life on Mars. I can't imagine anything more fundamental to our understanding uh, of our life and what happens here on Earth if we were to find and discover life on Mars. So, and having people as a part of that exploration, I think is going to be is going to be critical. So I think that's just one example. Also, I think it's important as far as uh, to be a great nation. Uh, great nations lead. They lead on things that are hard to do, like exploration. I think the best example is that is for those countries that don't have that exploration capability, uh, the time and effort they're spending to get it. I think China is a great example. So I think it's something that, uh, as a great nation, as a leader, uh, we need to keep leading uh, in exploration. Uh, and from an overall country perspective and an agency perspective, if you look, when you try to do something that no one else has done, try to go somewhere no, no one else has uh, been to, um, you create an environment where people become innovative. Um, they come up with new ideas, new approaches. It becomes a pull technology where you develop the technology in order to, to reach your goal, and that technology ends up benefiting mankind. So, you know, the things that came out of our early, the early space race, the things that have come out of the space shuttle program, as well as the International Space Station, I think benefit all mankind. Oh, I think it's mostly been said, but uh, I think it's human nature to want to discover. Uh, discovery is what humans uh, benefit from, what humans pursue, and learning is part of that discovery process. So for us, it's developing a capability, learning, discovering, and pushing the bounds of what the human race has done to this point. I think I have another question for all four of you, actually. I, I think you'd all have different and interesting examples. Um, and this is from Twitter, and it's, can you give examples of which technologies from the Apollo and shuttle are used in Orion? But I actually want to expand that just a little bit. So, so the legacy, what, what are you building on that's, that's, that's hardware, that's, that's, that's practically speaking related to Apollo and, and shuttle that's actually helping you do your jobs and that you're using to, to move forward? Um, so there's a couple of things uh, I would start with is the shape. Okay, you, lo you look at the shape of Orion, it's very similar uh, to Apollo. We've done a lot of studies on different shapes and it turns out this shape is actually very close to the optimum for this kind of deep space uh, and the entries that we're going to do. So I'd say we learned a lot from that and checked it again and found out that those guys got that part right. Um, there's a lot of things we learned about uh, radiation, about the lunar dust, those kind of things that we do take into account when we do our internal systems design because in the long run we hope we're going to be going to other bodies and need to be able to accommodate those kind of things. Um, Beyond that, though, the internal stuff, uh, computers, guidance navigation, and so forth, those are really uh, state of the art. We've taken uh, the latest updates for uh, highly reliable computer systems, networks, and those kind of, and then accommodated them into Orion. So I look at it as from the outside, uh, cars from the 50s and today look pretty similar. They have four wheels, they have a steering wheel, but the insides are fundamentally different. That's much more like where Orion is today. So the shape is the same because that still makes sense from a physics standpoint, but the internal parts, the part that actually keeps the crew safe and gets them to where they need to go is state of the art. 
and I guess when you, th a lot of times we think more toward hardware technologies when we talk about technology advancements and things that we use today. You know, I think one of the things that we've learned most from our from our early missions uh, in the past is the technologies and analytical tools. Um, the the tools that we use today are so far advanced from where we were, and a lot of that came from the early work that came from the Apollo program and others that allowed us to not only test but predict what the results of the test would be, verify those tests, and use those uh, advanced analytical tools to, to predict off-nominal events so we could deal with them in, in the future. So, so to me, the, the tools is a real technology advancement. So I really like this question because we've done a lot of study on the uh, Apollo program and the uh, Mercury program and Gemini programs and as the things have evolved, how they ended up choosing the assets that they used and the processing techniques, uh, much of which have been developed over the years, but fundamentally, um, like Mark said, with the shape of his spacecraft, Ground processing requires the basic capabilities to service, to test, and to launch. Those things we looked at, things like transport mode, things like uh, where you integrate a vehicle, uh, integrating a vehicle vertically versus horizontally. We studied all those items and looked at the best capabilities and ways to do it. Now, sure, you have modern capabilities, uh, you know, uh, launch processing systems, command and control systems, all of those things make uh, what has been done in the past far more uh, integrated and, and, and better in today's environment. But fundamentally, we're still the same. We're using a crawler to uh, get out of the VAB and transport it to the pad. Once it gets to the pad, it goes through a basic systems test to make sure it's integrated well with the servicing systems at the pad, so a blend of the old, blend of the new, but they were pretty smart guys in the Apollo era that uh, came up with this. Yeah, I think I would just echo that. I think the theme, you're, the theme you're hearing here is we take the best of what we had in the past and we add to it today's technologies, and we've done that over and over. Uh, from the basic design, from having a launch abort system and having the capsule on top of the rocket, that increases safety. We learned that the hard way, and, uh, and we're going to implement that. How we do operations, how we uh, do spacewalks. We've learned how to do spacewalks over the years, and we, we know how to do that better and better, how to build spacesuits, and then how to operate in space for long periods of time like we're learning on the space station. We're going to put all that to work to make this program work. A uh, question that came in from Twitter. Will Orion, as currently envisioned, be able to endure in orbit around Mars for the three years required for human surface missions? Uh, today, the Orion systems, we've designed them to, to be extensible for six months in a quiescent mode, you know, so uh, it could be orbiting around the moon. There was nobody on, uh, if it was unmanned system, the systems could survive for six months. Um, what we would have to do once we understand the Mars mission more and the specifics about uh, how long, where we would be going, how long we would be there, we'd have to look at each system and decide what it would take to certify those for longer duration. To find actually a lot of the systems can do that. It helps to, if we had crew on board. Um, in a Mars mission, I expect that we would, right, in orbit, so they could do maintenance uh, and check those systems out. So that'd be something that we would go look to extend where we started from the six months we have today. Another, another question from Twitter. Uh, do you think the Orion program will last longer than the shuttle program? So I, I believe it will because I think now we're moving back past Earth orbit. There are so many things for us to do beyond Earth orbit. Uh, asteroids, the moon, and on to Mars. Also, this Orion design from the beginning is designed to be flexible to handle all these different missions. So I believe it can, it can adapt, just like uh, there was a lot of adaptation between the early Apollo missions up to Apollo Soyuz. Uh, the shuttle design was adapted quite a bit to then become capable of flying ISS. So I think we're already starting with a very flexible system. So I think it can do so many, syst uh, so many different missions uh, as America decides where it wants to head that I believe it can la last a very, very long time. And the avionics is easily upgradable as well, so we can add new technology, uh, state-of-the-art computers as needed to keep us uh, in step with the technologies. Question for, for Rex, I believe, from, from Facebook. Uh, some deep flight 
uh, deep space flight missions could require six months to a year just to arrive at the destination. Uh, how would an astronaut spend uh, his or her days during that year's journey? That would be a challenge. Uh, it, it really would. You know, the thing about being in space and orbit on the space station uh, for six months is that you have the, the view of the Earth to look back on, and you can see your home, and it's right there. Uh, it's going to be a tremendous challenge uh, to take a, a vehicle like this and go off for potentially a three-year mission. And it's not going to be long, just a few weeks before the Earth starts receding in the distance, and the Earth is just one of the stars among the many. And I've heard some people say it's going to redefine the meaning of the word loneliness, and it will. But there's explorers out there, the same way we've had explorers in the past that crossed oceans, taken new lives, that have decided that they want to devote their lives to exploration, and they'll do that. It'll be tough, and there'll be times where it'll be a, a real a challenge to figure out mentally how you deal with that. But we'll prepare our people. They'll be excited to, to be the first people going to someplace like Mars. And I think, uh, I think we'll prepare them well, and they'll be able to handle that voyage. A question from, from Twitter. Is, is NASA working on a crew habitat to attach the Orion crew capsule for long duration missions? Uh, sorry, NASA's looking at a lot of different options of how to extend the stay uh, of the crew, uh, whether it be to an uh, asteroid or onto to Mars. So very, we're in the very early stages of thinking about ways to do that. Um, Orion, of course, was designed from the beginning to do rendezvous and docking. Uh, with space station or with a lander, and so clearly we could do that with a habitat. So it's, we're early in those uh, discussions. Okay. Uh, I think this may be for, for you and David. Uh, what will be the primary fuel for both Orion and, and SLS? Uh, is there any way to go faster by using some type of solar sail? Okay, well, if you look at our early capability, we're basically staying with current technologies that we have. You know, you have the LOX hydrogen engines, you have solid solid fuels, uh, you have uh, in-space upper stages. Um, and so from that standpoint, we are staying with existing technology, but we're looking to stretch that technology and, and get more out of it. I think long term, um, we will have to have some uh, sustained additional capability. Um, I think our, our partnering with the science communities and uh, technology development folks is, is allowing us to move forward anticipating that so I think some some type of um, you know solar cell some type of um, you know in space stage is different than what we have today we'll have to have something like that in the future yeah so for Orion we use you know hypergolic propellants uh, they're efficient they work great we have systems that are built to operate with them uh, they're less expensive so it's it's that's why it's part of the Orion design and it does the mission that it's supposed to do um, uh, but David mentioned, uh, NASA is also looking not only at the HAB, but let's say solar electric, other means to accelerate uh, these larger pieces out to these far durations. Those take a long time to do that, right? They're not very fast, but they uh, um, uh, get us to further destinations. So we're, we are looking at ways of accelerating the cargo kind of things, and then you get the crew there faster because you don't want the crew sitting on those for a very long time. But. Uh, what are the, this is from Twitter, what are the specifications of the Delta IV Heavy that lead it to uh, having been chosen for the EFT-1 launch? Things, it, we all, again, we all started from the objectives. The objectives of this test were really to stress the heat shield, stress the exploration functions of the Orion. Um, so there were really two launch vehicles that exist today uh, that could get us close to the velocities we need to stress the heat shield. Uh, one was Atlas V and the other is Delta IV. Um, the, the nice thing about the Delta IV is the Orion today could basically sit on top, uh, not require a, a significant fairing uh, upgrade to go do that. So that's part of what we gave the objectives to Lockheed. They did a search of the potential capabilities of the launch vehicle. So it came, came down to Delta V and minimizing modifications to both Orion and the launch vehicle. see, when will we be able to send humans to Mars, and when will we be able to send a human to Jupiter, or presumably around Jupiter? You want, you want to start? <laughs> well, so first things first, you know, we gotta, we gotta get uh, humans back beyond low Earth orbit, and that's what we're trying to do with Orion as soon as we can. Uh, and then I think the, the key will be what is the next destination and how do we uh, get the systems both technology and funding wise to make that happen. So right now there is no specific date 
for Mars. I think the key thing is to be pushing the envelope, learning more about extended duration, the kind of things that Rex talked about, uh, so that we uh, get those behind us and so we can uh, move forward on under the Mars trip. Yeah, and I think uh, this is a, a methodical program that we're going through. We're, this is just the very first, uh, first launch, but the important thing, this is Orion 001. You know, if we have the opportunity to look back from in the future about where this program went, there's no, there's no fixed assets that we're going to lose, like the space shuttle. The space shuttle eventually, we reused them until we, we, you know, we could continue using them, but they would eventually reach the end of their lifetime. And the other thing about the space shuttle program is that it eventually, you can, you can fly it, we could have flown it for 10 more years potentially, but we're never going to leave low Earth orbit with it. So with this vehicle, we can go any of these places. If we just do a build-up approach, and we can make it to Mars someday, it may take, we're not sure, but hopefully in, in, it, we can be in the Mars vicinity in the, in the 2030s. So I think that is a reasonably attainable goal, but it's going to be a stair-step, slow fashion. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be something we just have to remain committed to. And if we remain committed to as a nation, as a space agency, as a contractor family, I think we can do it. And, and I think the, the long-term evolvable approach to SLS in general um, allows us that. We start with an early capability, a 70 metric ton capability with the goal driving toward 130 metric tons. Um, Taking that evolvable approach will allow us to, to prove the technologies that we, we develop new for this. Uh, it'll allow us to, to take incremental steps, going to the moon first, uh, then maybe to an asteroid or toward Mars. So I think the, the evolvability is the real key. Hey, uh, an engineering question. I, um, I think you categorized this from, from Twitter, uh, and it's a doozy. Is there any practical way to generate artificial gravity on a spaceship or colony. Well, the only way to do it is to is to have a, a, a spacecraft that is tethered and that rotates, basically. So if you had two spacecraft with a long enough tether, you could rotate them on the way to Mars and you'd have artificial gravity. The only problem is if it's, it's got to be very, very large because it can be very disoriented if you have a large spin rate. So uh, it is possible. That would be one way to counteract, uh, counteract the zero-g in, in, in transit. But I think we're getting pretty good in the space station to find out ways to, con to combat uh, the, the atrophy you get from zero gravity by using exercise and, and countermeasures. So I think that won't be necessary, but it is possible to be, it'd be very difficult. Uh, this is a, an interesting question from, from, from Twitter. Uh, and maybe Rex can take the first crack at it. What qualities would you look for in the astronauts who will fly on Orion? Uh, and would an Olympian astrophysicist even make the cut? An Olympian astrophysicist? <laughs> well, yeah, they might. Uh, you know, there, there's a certain baseline technical expertise people need. And there's a lot of people that have that. But then the most important thing is the ability to get along with others and the ability to handle adversity. Even today with our six-month missions to the space station, we train our astronauts to how to cope with adversity. We, we train them to, to, to develop their coping skills. How do you cope with things when they go wrong? Uh, we do things like sending people out into the wilderness for 10-day uh, National Outdoor Leadership School training sessions where we, where we learn about what's it, what do these people, how do they react when they're cold and wet and hungry. And uh, you'd be surprised that when you, when you get in those situations, you can learn to develop those coping skills. So we need somebody who has coping skills because, like I said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a tremendous journey to go someplace like Mars. Uh, so you need the coping skills, you need the interpersonal relationship skills, somebody who gets along well with just about everybody. And then somebody who has an incredible psychological fortitude to handle something like that, to leave his whole world behind and go someplace new with the hope uh, of making new explorations and, and, uh, and, and not a complete guarantee of ever getting back. Uh, how long, this is from Twitter, how long will final assembly take on the EFT-1 Orion capsule, the one behind us? So, uh, what you see here is the primary structure uh, that will hold the pressure, for example, when we eventually uh, send people out into space. That primary structure took us a few months to put together, uh, but there are a lot of other pieces that are already in production that will start showing up here at the Cape. So I think the next couple of key things to think about is uh, all the avion, the, the computers, the cables, all that kind of stuff will start showing up. We'll actually power it on uh, in the February, March time frame here, right, right here in, in this building, do the integrated testing then. Uh, the heat shield shows up a little bit later than that. So by the end of uh, 2013, it'll be totally assembled and ready to be uh, shipped for the launch.
Okay, we just we have uh, just less than ten minutes, uh, so keep the great questions coming. Again, if you're on Twitter, uh, hashtag Ask NASA, and if you're on Google Plus or Facebook, uh, just find the comment thread and, and put your question there, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can before we have to end. Next question looks like it's from Facebook. How many test articles have been constructed and used so far? Start with the uh, Orion side, and then um, I know David's got stuff, and uh, Pepper does too. So for Orion, we had uh, Pad Abort One, which was uh, where we tested out the launch abort system. That was probably the the first big test article uh, that had to match the uh, mass properties pretty close of what Orion would look like because we did a full abort test um, using the full abort motor and added to control motor. So that was that was the big one. Um, we did a ground test article, which is actually also in this building, just a little bit down the way. Uh, did that one, first of all, to get our manufacturing processes figured out, and then we also did a lot of acoustic testing, because during liftoff, the rocket creates a lot of uh, sound uh, energy, as well as if we did an abort, uh, there's a lot of energy from that as well, so you need to test the structure under acoustic load and actually do vibration testing to see how it behaves. So we built a ground test article for that. Um, We've done some, a, a few boilerplates, which are basically simple structures that model Orion that we've dropped uh, at Langley in the pool there to get to, to calibrate our models. Um, uh, as far as we've had a lot of then component test articles like um, uh, panels of the structure that we've put under load, all sorts of smaller pieces that we've done that to, down to uh, triple E parts that we've tested. So I think if you're talking about the big ones, uh, those are the big ones today. EFT one's the next one. Of course, you see it behind us. Uh, we'll reuse this structure, uh, actually reuse the systems in it to do an ascent abort. Um, again, like I said, here out of the Cape, we'll put a peacekeeper first stage underneath it and go do that test here out of Florida. So that's, and then we're on to uh, um, EM1, which is in 2017. Um, from an SLS perspective, um, there's a lot of test articles we've had so far. You look at just in the J2X development, um, all of the, the, the motors that have been tested, the engines that have been tested down at Stennis. Um, there's been, from a solid standpoint, there's been three development motors. Um, then if you start looking toward our support for EFT1, we're in the process now of assembling our first test article, which is our Pathfinder article at Marshall Space Flight Center. And then uh, in the near term, we'll be, build, be building a structural test article also. Um, as we get into further development from a core vehicle standpoint, we'll have significant test articles with that too. So from an overall SLS standpoint, it's uh, been a significant amount of test articles uh, in support of where we are. And from a ground perspective, we largely benefit from the flight guys' test articles themselves. So we'll take a boilerplate that Mark developed and then we'll run our recovery operations tests for his uh, recovery operations that we'll uh, perform. So. We get benefit when the uh, SLS guys are building their assets. We take our teams and go out to the respective test sites where they have their test articles in, at play so we understand the functionality of the systems and can bring that to bear when we design our systems. So. Uh, the, the test article we have at JSC where we actually outfit it with the seats and uh, other systems inside so we make sure that the uh, crew functions can be done, the crew can put their suits on and off, they can get out in emergencies. So that's another test article that has more to do with um, human factors assessments. And I've been, I've been waiting for this question. Uh, I've seen it asked a few different ways, but you know, it's the Beatles or Stones, right? It's why have we returned to a capsule design and not a, not a, not a wing design? What, what is it about the capsule that makes it the right design for, for deep space moving forward? Yeah, it's really, it really comes down to, again, that uh, entry velocity um, for us. A, a wing vehicle can make a lot more sense in low Earth orbit. You're using it to give you more uh, flexibility on where you can land on the Earth's surface. Um, we can get that coming back from the moon. The guidance and navigation algorithms and techniques uh, nowadays are much better. We actually do a skip entry technique that slows us down and allows us to target very closely uh, where we want to go. and a a wing system would be much more difficult to uh, implement in the high velocities, and it really, it really would not add any functionality uh, to our system that we need. What, uh, and I, I think I'd ask you if um, 
maybe even the whole, you know, all the panelists, uh, what criteria would you find the EFT-1 mission deemed as successful? Successful. What are the, what are the success criteria for all of you? We have a long list of uh, specific data we're looking for on this test. Um, fundamentally, we're testing the heat shield, so that's the obvious one, and we're actually instrumenting it with hundreds of sensors, w which allow us to validate our models that we've done to design the system. So we'll actually get real data that says, look, the heat shield performed as expected, and the environment was what we expected, so that's a big one. We do a lot of the other key things we're going to test is the guidance and navigation system I mentioned. We're actually going to take control of the capsule. Uh, it has to control its attitude during entry to make sure we hit the target point. So that's a key one. Did the gene and C system work as planned? Uh, we have a lot of separation events. Uh, for example, the service module fairings will be jettisoned. The launch abort system will be jettisoned. Uh, the crew module is separate from the service module. These are all critical separation events that, again, we model very well. We have tools for. We're going to do some tests on the ground. But you really want to fly it in the flight environment to see that it works because they're very important to the system. And then we'll do the parachute deployment. Again, we, we do a lot of drop tests out in California, but we want, to do the, we want to do the parachute deploy in the exact environments and the ranges we're going to see on flight. So those are the, I would say those are the key objectives. So a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff packed into this one flight. I see only two minutes left, so I'm going to have to make, please. We're also, uh, as David said, we're working out our interfaces with SLS. So we're going to understand the loads to the upper stage. That's important. And Pepper's guys are actually going to recover the, the capsule on the West Coast with their nominal plan. So they're going to be exercising those things as well. Those are all key objectives to the flight. Okay, we're going to do speed round here. There's some really great, great questions. I want to get to as many as we can. Um, probably have time for like two more. Uh, the Orion capsule was built to explore. However, I'm a bit confused as to what capabilities will be without a landing module. Let's speak to that. Uh, yeah, the Orion is not by itself designed to land on another uh, terrestrial body. It's the, it's the part that gets the crew there safely and gets them home. Uh, if you actually want to land on another body, you would need a lander. Uh, so that's part of an architecture that would have to be uh, developed, so that's not the part of the mission that Orion performs. Okay. Why is it called Orion? Any special meaning behind the mission name? Um, gosh, I'm trying to remember. It has been so long ago we came up with that name. Uh, I think fundamentally because it's a part of um, human history to look to the stars. The Orion constellation is a big part of uh, what people have seen for a long time and, and I think uh, correlate with space and uh, and our curiosity about what's out there so okay unfortunately I think that's gonna have to have to do it for today uh, thank you all for for your time and for participating in this and thank you all for joining us if we didn't get to your question fear not uh, we'll, we'll get to as many as we can on on Twitter Facebook and Google Plus and we'll try to answer them over the next uh, couple of days before a holiday uh, if we still don't get to it just just keep hammering us on, on Twitter. We, we try to do as, as, uh, the best job we can to, to answer all questions that come into us. Today, NASA and Kennedy Space Center are again lifting our sights and lifting our spirit to new heights. The first Orion spacecraft destined for orbit arrived at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida to begin processing for a flight test in 2014. The flight test, called Exploration Flight Test 1, or EFT-1, will not carry any people into space during the mission. Instead, it will be loaded with a wide variety of instruments to evaluate how it behaves during launch, in the vacuum of space, and through the searing heat of re-entry. Later Orion spacecraft will take astronauts far beyond Earth on missions to an asteroid. The moon, and perhaps even Mars. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to Mars. We know that the Orion capsule is a critical part of the system that is going to take us there. And so we're working on it. For now though, all attention is focused on completing the assembly of this Orion. The work will take place in the Operations and Checkout Building at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Refurbished extensively in 2006, the high bay at the ONC has been outfitted with large fixtures and tooling to turn the aluminum shell of Orion into a functioning spacecraft complete with avionics, 
instrumentation, and the heat shield. A Delta IV heavy rocket from United Launch Alliance will lift the capsule into an orbit reaching 3,600 miles, about 15 times higher than the International Space Station. The mission will last only a few hours, long enough to make two orbits before being sent plunging back into the atmosphere and parachuting safely into the ocean. Wir hier in Berlin haben am Wochenende schwere Gewitterstürme Deutschland heimgesucht und vielen Menschen unruhige Nächte beschert. Blitze, Sturmböen, starker Regen und Hagel richteten Millionenschäden an. Allein in Berlin wurden letzte Nacht über 8000 Blitze gezählt. Über 260 Mal musste die Feuerwehr in der Hauptstadt ausrücken. Denn nicht nur Blitze, auch heftige Sturmböen und Regenfälle sorgten für eine Weltuntergangsstimmung. Wegen der Wassermassen musste die Berliner Stadtautobahn kurzzeitig gesperrt werden. Umgeknickte Bäume, abgedeckte Dächer, zerstörte Autos und überall Wasser. In einer halben Stunde ist alles passiert, so voll überall Wasser. Wie Wähle kommt durch meinen Laden bis dahin. Und auch unsere Nachbarn sind nicht besser dran. In der Schweiz wie hier in Zürich entwurzelte Bäume, überflutete Straßen. Dazu noch Hagel, der für einen Hauch von Winter im Juli sorgt. Und auch in Frankreich wüteten die Unwetter. Durch die Vogesen zog ein Mini-Tornado, deckte Fassaden und Dächer ab. Durch die Fenster sind alle möglichen Gegenstände geflogen, Teile von Schornsteinen und Dächern. Blitze, Donner, Sturm und Regen. Für einige könnte es auch heute eine unruhige Nacht werden. Ja, Blitze, Donner und Starkregen. In der vergangenen Nacht ist eine zweite schwere Gewitterfront über Deutschland hinweggezogen. Besonders betroffen der Süden und der Osten. Und diesmal waren die Folgen noch verheerender als in der Nacht zuvor. Eine Frau kam in Bayern ums Leben, als ein Baum auf ihr Auto stürzte. Insgesamt wurden mehr als 100 Menschen verletzt, 51 davon durch einen Blitzeinschlag auf einem Rockfestival bei Torgau in Sachsen. Martin Eberl berichtet. Gegen Abend zog die zweite Unwetterfront des Wochenendes mit Sturmböen und Starkregen von Südwesten über Deutschland hinweg. Auch diesmal kamen Menschen zu Schaden. Abgerissene Äste und umherfliegende Gegenstände verletzten 18 Besucher eines Musikfestivals im bayerischen Oettingen. Polizei und Feuerwehr räumten das Gelände. Mit dem Schrecken und lediglich Sachschäden davon kamen hingegen 200 Jugendliche eines Zeltlagers und die Gäste eines Vereinsfests in Baden-Württemberg. Da haben wir hier diese Sturmböen gehabt, wo uns die Zelte übereinander geschmissen haben, Zelte gebrochen. Wir konnten glücklicherweise alle Personen konnte sich noch retten da in, ins feste Gemäuer. Weiter östlich im sächsischen Reutsch Jora verletzte ein einziger Blitzeinschlag auf einem Heavy Metal Festival 51 Besucher, neun davon sogar schwer. Alle sind jedoch außer Lebensgefahr. Ausnahmezustand auch für die Berliner Feuerwehren, die zweite Nacht in Folge. 260 Einsätze, mehr als doppelt so viele wie gestern. Diesmal hatten wir allerdings überwiegend Wasserschäden, vollgelaufene Keller, äh, Wassereinbrüche in Wohnungen. Sturmschäden wie in der Nacht zuvor gab es in der letzten Nacht kaum. Dennoch richteten vom Sturm entwurzelte Bäume wieder massive Schäden an. Ein Motorradfahrer konnte nicht mehr rechtzeitig bremsen, als ein Baum direkt vor ihm quer über diese Landstraße bei Dresden kippte. Der Biker erlitt schwere Verletzungen. Weitere Gewitter werden erwartet. Wie heftig sich die entladen, dazu eher später im Wetter. In den USA haben an diesem Wochenende heftige Unwetter gewütet. Dabei kamen mindestens 13 Menschen ums Leben. Vor allem über den Nordosten des Landes zogen Gewitterstürme hinweg. In Millionen Haushalten fiel der Strom aus. Und das bei Rekordtemperaturen um die 40 Grad. Aus den USA unser Korrespondent Pitt Klein. Das Sturmbahn peitschte mit Windgeschwindigkeiten von bis zu 150 Stundenkilometer von Indiana bis New Jersey über den Osten der USA. Das Resultat verheerend. Entwurzelte Bäume, eingeschlagene Dächer. Bislang werden 13 Todesopfer beklagt. Zweieinhalb Millionen Menschen sind ohne Strom. Vielerorts ist der Notstand ausgerufen. Das ist fast die Größenordnung des letzten Hurricanes. 
Die Energie für den Sturm kam von einer Hitzewelle über weiten Teilen der USA. So wurden im Großraum Washington 40 Grad Celsius gemessen. Wer sich nicht unter Springbrunnen abkühlen kann, für den werden in Schulen sogenannte Kühlungszentren eröffnet. Denn ohne Strom weder Kühlschränke noch Klimaanlagen. Wir gehen jetzt ins Einkaufszentrum. Da ist es wenigstens kühl. Bis das letzte Haus wieder an das Stromnetz angeschlossen ist, wird es bis zu sieben Tage dauern. Aber Stromausfälle sind die Amerikaner dank ihrer maroden Infrastruktur mit oberirdischen Stromleitungen gewöhnt. Ja, ja leider bei ja. einem Thema. Wir ja. hätten ja, heute ja, Abend gern klar. gefeiert. Ja, Andreas. natürlich, klar. Aber leider, leider müssen wir heute Abend nur zuschauen, liebe Zuschauer. Das EM-Finale in Kiew steigt ohne Deutschland. Aber klitzekleiner Trost. Immerhin wartet auf die Fans ein Echter Kracher. Italien mit Ballermann Mario Balotelli gegen Spanien, das unbedingt den dritten großen Titel in Folge holen will. Doch Italien ist die Mannschaft der Stunde. Liebe Zuschauer, willkommen zu den Heute-Nachrichten. Der neue Fußball-Europameister steht fest. Spanien hat es geschafft und damit drei große Titel in Folge geholt. Die Italiener lange Zeit in der Unterzahl völlig chancenlos. Am Ende stand es 4 zu 0, der höchste Sieg, der je in einem Finale erzielt wurde. Vollgas, Fußball, erste Sahne, jubelten die Kommentatoren. Vier Tore und der Titeltrippel. Die spanischen Fans sind im Fußballhimmel waren aber von vornherein siegesgewiss, wie unsere Korrespondentin Nathalie Steger aus Madrid berichtet. Die haben von Anfang an gesagt, wir werden Europameister und jetzt haben sie es geschafft. Und hier hinter mir, da tanzt Madrid. Mensch, und die Leute sind so froh, die haben uns immer wieder gesagt, Fußball, das lenkt uns mal ab in diesen Krisenzeiten. Von der Rekordarbeitslosigkeit, der Bankkrise, endlich gibt es mal positive Schlagzeilen. Die Nationalmannschaft landet morgen am Flughafen, fährt im offenen Bus in die Innenstadt und pünktlich um 20.30 Uhr werden sie dann gefeiert, zum dritten Mal nacheinander, wie vor zwei Jahren und wie vor vier Jahren. Hey. Good to meet you. Ma'am. Hey. Good morning. Hello. Thank you. Okay, take pictures, take pictures. Did you come here to take pictures or to be photographed? Alexander Yurievna. Here is Sanito. Well, you still have a chance to say hello. Good to see you. How are you? Good. Where did you go? To the Black Sea. For a month. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning. You are so important. Good to see you. This is our first time, so we were like, okay, we're like the right now, day after. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't really... Sometimes they don't really like to be photographed, and they're hiding. She remembers, I think. Are you ready? Always. God bless you. 
Well, I'll stop by your room just in case a little bit later. Hey, family, family, get together, a family picture. My dear friends, do come in into our um, restaurant. Uh, do come in. Tell us what's about to happen here at the crew canteen. So we're getting ready um, to leave to go to Baikonur, and um, before that we get to have a quick moment to talk to the former cosmonauts and the present cosmonauts and astronauts who are here, and just for them to give us a well wish and ask for us to say good luck to them and thank you for their support. So it's pretty significant. Hello, my hero. Good to see you. That's my grandson. Shall we? Let's go. Well, is everybody ready? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, let's go. Take your daddy by his hand. <laughs> We're like clearing the path for everybody, right? Get together, everybody. No, you look good. Stay there. Together? <laughs> okay, get in here. 
Okay, let's take a picture under the Lenin statue, under the Lenin statue. Yes, Ready. So the crew coming over here. We've got five minutes. Uh, please, your questions. I think the most important is our teamwork together as a, as a crew, and we've uh, taken advantage of the two and a half years to learn about each other and our families, and I think we're, we're one big team. I think uh, the most difficult part is probably leaving our families. You are the symbol of the cooperation between the, uh, the whole world, uh, United States, Russia, and uh, so on, so on. So uh, what uh, for you it means the cooperation between the whole world? Um, a parallel is, I think, the Olympics. Um, you know, it's going to be the same time that we're up there. Uh, it means cooperation and friendship, learning about each other, understanding each other, and making for a better planet, a better world. Do you think that it's important for the whole world, uh, this cooperation, uh, not just in the uh, cosmos, uh, just in the, uh, the political world, like that? Absolutely, and I hope, uh, I hope what we do is a, is a, a slight role model for the, the rest of the world about how much you can do with international cooperation. The space station is simply amazing uh, engineering project, scientific laboratory, and uh, that's what we can do when we put our minds together. Next question, please. So it's uh, it's a little bit of a relaxing time since we're away from all the uh, busyness of the normal life uh, and our families. We'll miss our families, but we'll have a, a chance to get some rest before we actually launch. We have a chance to prepare for the very busy schedule that we'll have when we get there. Uh, right away, we'll have a Japanese HTV uh, followed by progress, followed by by some spacewalks, Russian and uh, USOS, so it's going to be really busy. So the two weeks down there will allow us to do our final preparations and get rested up and ready to go. Um, we're all we're all getting excited to launch in the Soyuz. Just can't wait. It's going to be it's going to be great. Could you please tell us uh, what? How do you feel? Well, we are leaving for the Baikonur today, and uh, we are all excited. We have our families and friends to say goodbye to us. They wished us all the best, and I'm expecting that uh, we will be working very closely, doing a lot of very interesting um, things on board the station, and we are all excited. Thank you. はい、あの、それで昨日あの前のそういうスクールが帰還しまして、今日我々がバイクのように出発しますけれども、打ち上げまで残すところあと2週間、リラックスしながら打ち上げを迎えたいと思います。約4ヶ月半、引き続き応援
were together. Goodbye. Samantha Bay con el número 33. Good Monday morning from the International Space Station Flight Control Room. This is Mission Control Houston. You're looking at a team of flight controllers that uh, have been working on console since early this morning, uh, watching over all systems aboard the International Space Station. The uh, team is on a nine-hour uh, rotation shift, uh, covering three shifts around the clock to support International Space Station uh, operations. The uh, team today is being led by uh, veteran flight director Emily Nelson. She is uh, uh, overseeing this team throughout the day. She's also joined on her right by Christy Bertels, who is serving as the communications link between the flight control team here and the crew aboard uh, the International Space Station. The International Space Station is uh, currently uh, flying uh, high above Europe, uh, currently uh, passing uh, across Turkey on a southeasterly trajectory that will take it into an orbital sunset uh, here in about 10 minutes or so. And from this vantage point of 247 statute miles, the station is circling the Earth every 92 minutes. Uh, and that, of course, um, is, uh, means the station's traveling about five miles per second or about 17,000 uh, miles per hour. On board the station uh, now, a new crew, uh, Expedition 32. Of course, uh, these three gentlemen have been aboard the station for uh, 50 days, 48 days now, 50 days in space, but they have transitioned to Expedition 32. In the center is the commander of Expedition 32, Gennady Padalka. On his, uh, on his left is U.S. astronaut Joe Akaba, and on his right is uh, Russian cosmonaut Sergei Revin. These uh, three crew members transitioned to Expedition 32 late Saturday night, uh, U.S. Central Time, after the departure of uh, three other crew members uh, that made up Expedition 31, Oleg Kononenko, Andrei Kuipers, and Don Pettit, uh, returned home early Sunday morning after 193 days in space, 191 days uh, aboard the International Space Station. They uh, returned home uh, to... Uh, Partly cloudy skies, a uh, beautiful uh, video of the uh, return home of their uh, Soyuz uh, TMA-03M spacecraft uh, on the steppe of Kazakhstan, just to the southeast of Jezkazgan, which is in the southern landing zone uh, targeted for that uh, return home. Uh, those three crew members now uh, safely back uh, uh, with Gennady our Oleg Kononenko back uh, in Star City, uh, just outside Moscow, and uh, Kuipers and Pettit uh, returned home aboard a NASA plane uh, shortly after uh, checkups uh, and the landing, and they are now back uh, here in Houston. The uh, crew on board today spending some off-duty time, uh, but they also are continuing to work on uh, experiments and uh, housekeeping chores around the International Space Station. Padalka and Revan uh, have been inspecting some circuit breakers and some fuses in the pier's docking compartment of the Russian segment. They've also performed some maintenance in the Zvezda service modules, ventilation system, and some Earth observation uh, photography as well. Akaba is... Uh, been uh, working with the flight control team uh, here in Houston uh, on some several experiments that are overseen by uh, NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. He's also uh, performed a communications test between the onboard smartphone that uh, is aboard the station that's associated with the SPHERES experiment, known as the Synchronized Position Hold and Gauge re uh, reorient experimental satellites, those small um, bowling ball sized satellites that are used for interaction with uh, 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 school kids on the ground uh, through some autonomous or robotic operations. 
So the crew members uh, will wrap up their day as usual with uh, going to bed about 4.30 in the afternoon, uh, but they uh, continue uh, throughout the latter half of their day uh, working with the station systems and uh, ensuring that all of the uh, components aboard the station are in good working order, supporting their activities on board as they uh, press through what's now their uh, 50th day in space, their 48th day aboard the International Space Station. Hi, SUNY. This is Clara Moskowitz with Space.com. How are you doing? Very good. How are you doing, Clara? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for taking the time. Um, so, so I was hoping you could start off by giving us a little bit of a preview toward some of the major milestones you're looking forward to during your mission. Yeah, it's going to be pretty exciting um, right from the get-go. You know, of course, we're launching a little later than we planned, and so it's going to be right as soon as we open the hatch, it, we're going to hit the ground running, as they say, but I guess hit the space floating. I don't know how you would say that, but right away we have um, an HTV vehicle, which is a Japanese transfer vehicle, coming up, and so we'll do some training, get ready for that. That's right after we, uh, we rendezvous and dock from the Soyuz. Um, shortly thereafter, or in that time frame, we also have a Russian vehicle 48P Progress coming up, and it will be doing um, a couple, ex you know, experiments in its rendezvous system. Um, we have a Russian EVA coming, going on shortly thereafter, then potentially a U.S. EVA, maybe another commercial vehicle coming up, and inter meshed with all of that, we have a myriad of science that we're that we're going to do that's on our plate. So we're ready. Uh, we're ready to hit. The hit space floating. I guess you. I guess you would say. <laughs> so to have all these these visiting vehicles coming and going, does that really require a lot of input from the crew? Does that become a big event for you? Yeah, it's you know they, they dock on different ports to the space station. The ATV, the European Transfer Vehicle, and the Progress dock on the Russian ports. On the you, if you look at the space station, you would say the back side of the space station. Um, those vehicles are automated. However, uh, you need a crew there just in case anything with the automated uh, system goes wrong um, to back that up and be able to fly it in and also be ready to do the undocking and when the when the vehicle is finished. Now on the on on the American side or USOS side, we call it the US operating system side, we have the HTV, we had SpaceX, uh, hopefully in the future we'll have an orbital vehicle up there. All of those require the, uh, the crew on board to use the Canadian robotic arm to grab that vehicle and then dock it onto the space station. So yes, yeah, there is pretty extensive involvement from the crew on both ends of the spacecraft when the vehicles are coming up to visit. Wow. And you mentioned that there's a chance that a commercial vehicle might be coming up while you're up there. Um, you know, if that happens, would that be a big departure? Would it seem like a big change from the kind of vehicles you're used to? No, um, you know, SpaceX had brought up a vehicle once already, and uh, what we're looking at is possibly their second vehicle coming up, and so it's not a departure from what we've done, in, and in the future we've had the Japanese uh, transfer vehicle come up, and so the end game for us, where we are actually grabbing it with the robotic arm and docking it onto the space station, has, is something that has been done before. Of course, our crew, it will be the first time for our crew, so I think we're all a little nervous about it, but we've had great training at Johnson Space Center and um, we're ready for that and uh, we're looking forward to the challenge. So it's not something new, it's just uh, something that's progressing. Every step it gets a, a little bit better. And, and how different will the space station itself be from when you were last there? Um, I, I, I didn't count up all the modules exactly, but I think it's almost double in size. Uh, since I was there we have uh, new, vehicle, new modules, Node 2, the Columbus, the Japanese uh, laboratory, the Japanese exposed platform. We have two new Russian uh, modules as well, MRM1 and MRM2. So I think that's almost uh, probably double the size of from what I was there last time. And, and some of these modules don't are not in line like they were last time. They stick off from the side and at the top and the bottom. Um, so I was joking around with my crewmate saying that I'm ready for a good game of hide and go seek. Yeah. And and this time you're going to be commander. You know, for people that aren't so familiar with these jobs, what does commanding the space station involve? 
Right. So we have um, at any most time we have about six people up there, and they're uh, Russians, Americans, and then one of our international other international partners, Japanese, will be with a Japanese astronaut will be with us while we're up there. Um, so the, it's a little bit complicated in the Soyuz launch scheme and who's on board. So the crew that's uh, the experienced crew that's on board is the crew that's in command. Uh, when that crew leaves, which will be uh, Gennady Padalka, Sergey Revin, and Joe Acaba, uh, me, uh, my crew, me and uh, Yuri Malenchenko and Aki Hoshidi will be the more experienced crew. We'll be the crew that's in charge. I'll be the commander of our crew, and we'll be ready to welcome up three other uh, astronauts, cosmonauts, Kevin Ford and two rookie cosmonauts, Evgeny Tarelkin and Olaf Navinsky. And so during that time while we're up there and we are the, the experienced crew and I'm the commander, um, if any off nominal situations, emergencies happen, we're the crew that is responsible for taking care of that. In particular, I am the, I am the guy as the commander who leads the response. But I have said before, I think we've already decided and what we've done is work together for two and a half years on the ground establishing relationships um, and that was sort of my biggest goal as the commander is so that we are like brothers and sisters up there I and mean, you actually even know what the other guy's thinking before they even take an action and so our, our communication our relationships together is what I feel is the most important thing as the commander of, this, of the space station. Thank you so much Cindy. Thank you it's great talking to you. Good Tuesday morning from the NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. This is Mission Control Houston. You're looking at the International Space Station Flight Control Room from the front corner of the room looking over the shoulders and over the front of the consoles of flight control team that is watching over all of these space station systems aboard the International Space Station. The um, team of flight control controllers uh, here in Houston have been on console since early this morning. They're part of a three-team complement that uh, watches over station crew and systems around the clock, uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The uh, team, once again, is led by Flight Director Emily Nelson. She is in the uh, beige sweater uh, overseeing this team once again today, and she's joined also again by Christy Bertels, who's handling the uh, voice communications link between uh, the flight control team here in Houston, and the Expedition 32 crew aboard the International Space Station. The uh, International Space Station just about to move into an orbital sunrise high above the uh, South Pacific on a northeasterly track that will take it uh, shortly across the uh, Central America region, uh, all the way across the Gulf of Mexico, and then skirting uh, straight up the east coast of the United States, heading out uh, over the Gulf of uh, Lawrence uh, in Canada, uh, over the North uh, Atlantic, and then uh, another coastal crossing uh, as it co crosses the coast of France in Europe. From this uh, vantage point, 250 miles above uh, the Earth, the station circles the Earth every 92 minutes, circling the Earth every uh, uh, at that uh, distance, uh, 17,000 miles per hour, about five miles per second, offering an orbital sunrise and sunset to the crew on board about every 45 minutes. That crew aboard the International Space Station now in its 48th uh, day aboard the uh, complex and 50 days now in space is uh, comprised of Commander Gennady Padalki, you see there in the center of the picture, a flight engineer uh, number two aboard the station, Sergei Revin, in the left in this view, and then on the right is U.S. astronaut Joe Acaba. Acaba's on his second flight into space, but his first long-duration mission. He flew on the STS-119 space shuttle flight. Sergei Revin is on his first flight into space, and uh, Gennady Padalka uh, on his fourth mission. He's uh, flown on two uh, long-duration uh, space flights. This is uh, actually his third and his fourth as commander. He's been he served as commander of all four missions that he has been on. His first was aboard the Russian space station Mir. The crew uh, today has worked with experiments and conducted household chores and exercise and long-distance calls with uh, ground-based doctors for their routine checkups. Uh, commander Gennady Padalka and uh, Sergei Revin have performed a morning inspection around the station after their wake up. They've also tested the caution and warning panels inside the Zvezda service module. 
Uh, Revan has performed a periodic virus scan on some of the auxiliary computer system laptops, and he's uh, provided that status back to the flight controllers in Moscow. Akaba's focused his day on uh, a couple of experiments, the burning and suppression of solids experiment known as BASS. He's also worked with the binary colloid alloy test uh, experiment and also worked with uh, inspection and downlink of photographs associated with the resistive exercise device, one of the uh, various exercise equipment uh, complements uh, aboard the International Space Station. Uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, the crew is scheduled uh, to be off duty. They'll spend the day uh, monitoring experiments where needed, and they'll also have an opportunity to uh, talk with their families as well. Meanwhile, at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, uh, three other uh, crew members are preparing uh, for their uh, launch to the space station. U.S. astronaut Sonny Williams and um, Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Aki Hoshide uh, will uh, launch along with Soyuz TMA-05M Commander Yuri Malenchenko um, uh, from the Baikonur Cosmodrome a little bit later this month. They have performed suit fit checks at the integration facility at Baikonur as part of their pre-launch preparations. So a uh, busy day for the crew on board today, a day off uh, tomorrow as uh, their three colleagues who are headed their way in a couple of weeks are preparing uh, for their launch from Baikonur. Die hunderte Millionen Kilometer lange Reise zum Asteroiden Vesta mit der Raumsonde Dawn soll also die Frage aller Fragen beantworten, wie ist die Grundlage allen Lebens entstanden. Natürlich werden die Resultate solcher Expeditionen mit höchster Spannung erwartet. Diese Aufnahmen sind eine Sensation. Das erste Geländemodell eines Asteroiden. Es zeigt Krater mit nie gesehenen Formen und viele steile Hänge. Vesta heißt der Himmelskörper. Ein fliegendes Geschichtsbuch. Er lässt die Forscher weit zurückschauen in der Zeit. Vesta bildete sich aus einer riesigen Wolke aus Staub und Gas, wie alle Himmelskörper in unserem Sonnensystem. Vor mehr als viereinhalb Milliarden Jahren. Die Materie klumpte zu immer größeren Brocken und die wuchsen zu sogenannten Protoplaneten heran. Deren Schwerkraft sog immer mehr Materie auf. So bildete sich aus solchen Protoplaneten auch unsere Erde. Nur in der Nähe von Jupiter konnten keine Planeten entstehen. Dessen Schwerkraft verhinderte, dass die Gesteinsbrocken weiter durch Zusammenballung wuchsen. Diese Überreste bildeten den sogenannten Asteroidengürtel zwischen Jupiter und Mars, in dem auch Vesta die Sonne umrundet. Ein Planetenkeim, in dem das ursprüngliche Baumaterial erhalten blieb. Deshalb lässt sich noch heute an Vestas Oberfläche erkunden, was damals passierte, in den ersten 50 Millionen Jahren unseres Sonnensystems. Doch Vesta macht Planetenforschern die Arbeit schwer. Das Problem bei dieser Aber wir haben jetzt die Gewaltige Einschläge haben ihre Oberfläche zertrümmert, sodass die Wissenschaftler eine dicke Schuttschicht auf dem Asteroiden vorfinden. Auch die steilen Abhänge machen ihnen zu schaffen. Dort kommt der Schutt immer wieder ins Rutschen und durchmischt sich. Das muss man natürlich alles wieder so rekonstruieren, wie es ursprünglich ausgesehen hat. Man muss sich vorstellen, das ist wie... Eine in sich komplett zusammengestürzte Pyramide, das sehen Sie nur noch einen Dreckhaufen, aber die Archäologen kriegen letztlich doch raus, was da äh, mal los war, wie die gebaut wurde und wer drin lag. Und genau das wollen wir auch tun. Diese Meteoritenstücke sind eine wertvolle Hilfe dabei. Die Forscher vermuten, sie müssen von Vesta stammen. Bei einem Einschlag wurden sie aus dem Asteroiden herausgerissen und einige davon bis zur Erde geschleudert. In Laboren wurde untersucht, woraus besteht das Gestein? Wie reflektiert es Licht? Diese Informationen vergleichen die Forscher mit den Daten der Raumsonde Dawn, um deren Aufnahmen zu verstehen. Doch bevor Kameras und Spektrometer Bilder liefern konnten, musste die Sonde erst einmal einen langen Weg zurücklegen. 
Um Treibstoff zu sparen, reiste sie mit einem elektrischen Antrieb. Dorn ist ein Raumschiff mit Ionenantrieb. Das hört sich äh, sehr spektakulär an. Raumschiff Enterprise hat auch Ionenantrieb, nur äh, in der Wirklichkeit ist ein Ionenantrieb etwas ganz Langsames. Es werden zwar Xenonionen in einem Magnetfeld beschleunigt, aber der Schub, der dabei entsteht, der ist minimal. Wenn man das lang genug tut, dann kriegt man schon irgendwann Geschwindigkeit, aber es ist nicht so, dass man jetzt mal ganz schnell aufs Gas treten kann oder wieder bremsen kann. Deshalb mussten Forscher und Ingenieure die Dorn-Mission vorausplanen wie keine zuvor, ohne Vesta und ihre Umgebung genau zu kennen. Während sich die Sonde ihrem Ziel näherte, musste sie zugleich nach herumfliegenden Gesteinsbrocken Ausschau halten. Um schnell auszuweichen, ist sie zu träge. Angespannt verfolgten die Planetenforscher, wie die Sonde im Juli 2011 in ihrer Umlaufbahn um Vesta einschwenkte. Der erste Orbit um einen Asteroiden. Aber dann, wenn die Phase kommt, wo die Kameras richtig angeschaltet werden, die Spektrometer, wo die Daten reinkommen und wo man dann immer ein Stückchen mehr sieht, dann ist es schon äußerst gewaltig. Seitdem inspiziert die Raumsonde den Asteroiden aus immer kleinerer Entfernung. Den größten Teil seiner Oberfläche hat sie schon kartiert. Nur den Nordpol konnte sie noch nicht komplett sehen. Denn dort herrschte lange Zeit dunkle Winternacht. Forscher in Katlenburg-Lindau sorgen dafür, dass Dorns Augen die gewünschten Bilder liefern. Dabei hilft ihnen diese Kopie ihrer Kamera im Labor. An der testen sie alle Befehle, bevor sie zu den Kameras auf der Raumsonde geschickt werden. Auch die haben die Forscher mit so einem Filterrad ausgestattet, um den Planetenkeim in sieben Lichtspektren zu sehen. So wollen sie die Mineralogie von Vesta erkunden. Wenn man die mineralogische Zusammensetzung äh, eines Körpers kennt, dann kann man die Entwicklungsgeschichte dieses Körpers ergründen. Und das heißt im Wesentlichen, dass äh, Minerale, bestimmte Minerale bilden sich bei bestimmten Temperaturen und Drücken. Die Raumsonde hat auf dem Asteroiden die gleichen Minerale entdeckt, die auch in den Meteoroiden vorkommen. Ein Beleg, dass die Bruchstücke von Vesta stammen. Wollen die Forscher sehen, wie diese Minerale verteilt sind, müssen sie unterschiedliche Farbaufnahmen kombinieren. So konnten sie zum Beispiel feststellen, wo Gestein aus tieferen Schichten an die Oberfläche von Vesta gelangte. Und nachweisen, dass der bizarre Himmelskörper zwei gigantische Meteoriteneinschläge überstanden hat. Vesta war schon groß genug, um einen Gesteinsmantel auszubilden, der einen metallischen Kern umhüllt. Auch die Erde ist schalenförmig aufgebaut und könnte sich so entwickelt haben. Bei der Erde war es nicht eine Vesta, sondern Tausende oder Zehntausende oder Hunderttausend Vestas, die sich da zusammengefunden haben und die Erde gebildet haben. Aber es muss irgendwann mal mit einer Vesta oder ein bisschen was Größerem so angefangen haben. Bis zum August wird die Raumsonde den Planetenkeim noch inspizieren. Dann soll sie zu ihrem nächsten Ziel aufbrechen. Ceres, eine rätselhafte, eisige Welt, über die Planetenforscher so gut wie nichts wissen. Die Kernphysiker am Schweizer Forschungszentrum CERN haben einen möglicherweise bahnbrechenden Erfolg zu vermelden. Es sei gelungen, ein Teilchen nachzuweisen, bei dem es sich aller Wahrscheinlichkeit nach um das Higgs-Boson handelt. Dieses sogenannte Gottesteilchen ist der Theorie nach dafür verantwortlich, dass sämtliche Elementarteilchen eine Masse haben. Benannt wurde es nach dem britischen Physiker Peter Higgs. Er hatte das Modell des Higgs-Bosons bereits 1964 entwickelt. Wenige Sekundenbruchteile nach dem Urknall soll es existiert haben. Das mysteriöse Higgs-Teilchen, das allen anderen überhaupt erst Masse gibt. Ein ganz wichtiger Puzzlestein der physikalischen Standardtheorie. Doch bislang konnte es nie nachgewiesen werden. Schon seit Jahren fahnden Wissenschaftler im Kernforschungszentrum CERN bei Genf in einer riesigen Röhre unter der Erde nach diesem sogenannten Gottesteilchen. Sie beschleunigen darin kleinste Partikel fast auf Lichtgeschwindigkeit, lassen sie kollidieren und werten dann Unmengen neuer Daten aus. Heute nun der Durchbruch. Ja, ich glaube, wir haben eine große Entdeckung gemacht. Wir haben ein Teilchen gefunden, vermutlich das Teilchen, was wir seit 50 Jahren suchen. Seit 50 Jahren. Jetzt müssen wir noch feststellen, ob es wirklich dieses Teilchen ist. Aber wir haben ein neues Teilchen entdeckt, was genau 
auf dieses Teilchen passen würde. Viel spricht also dafür, dass es tatsächlich das Higgs-Teilchen ist. Manch Wissenschaftler fände ein anderes Ergebnis aber fast noch interessanter. Wenn es jetzt das Higgs-Teilchen wäre, was wir wirklich suchen seit langer Zeit, dann ist es, ich will nicht sagen langweilig, aber dann ist es doch eine, sagen wir, eine vorhergesehene Entdeckung. Wenn es jetzt etwas Neues wäre, dann wäre es wirklich etwas Unvorhergesehenes, etwas wirklich ganz Neues und das wäre eigentlich noch viel spannender. Ende des Jahres soll auch das geklärt sein. Dann sind die Wissenschaftler im CERN auf ihrer Suche nach dem Ursprung des Seins ein ganzes Stück weiter. Ein halbes Jahr, strenge Geheimhaltung am CERN in Genf. Jetzt endlich haben sich Forscher zum gut gehüteten Geheimnis geäußert. Wurde genau hier also der letzte noch fehlende Baustein des Kosmos gefunden? Sie waren zurückhaltend geworden nach der beinahe Blamage mit Meldungen, Einstein hätte Unrecht und es gäbe Teilchen, die schneller sind als Licht. Und Rolf Norbert Heuer, der Chef des CERN, ist bei aller Begeisterung auch diesmal noch vorsichtig. Schließlich geht es um das, wozu CERN überhaupt ersonnen und gebaut wurde. Es geht um die letzte ungelöste Frage, woraus alles im Universum aufgebaut ist. Es geht um das sogenannte Standardmodell und etwas, das seit Jahrzehnten fehlt. Einfach ist es nicht, das Standardmodell. Ausgeschrieben als Formel ist die Welt dann doch nicht so einfach. Es sind exakt zwölf Bausteine, die darin vorkommen. Elementarteilchen wie das Elektron oder die sechs Quarks. Aber auch exotische Namen wie das Tau-Neutrino, nachgewiesen erst im Jahr 2000. Alles steht und fällt mit einem letzten Baustein, sein Symbol H, das Higgs-Teilchen. Um es zu finden, brauchte man CERN und den Beschleuniger. Es begann in den 80er Jahren mit dem Beschaffen von Geld. Viel Geld. Die englische Premierministerin Margaret Thatcher war eine besonders harte Nuss. Wenn ihr mir, einem Politiker, einfach erklären könnt, was ihr davor habt, dann könnt ihr das Geld haben. Also ich will wissen, was denn nun diese Higgs-Teilchen sind. Die erste Antwort, Higgs-Teilchen tun folgendes. Sie verleihen den Elementarteilchen Masse. Das würde eine Margaret Thatcher nicht wirklich überzeugen. Da kam einer mit einem Vergleich. Higgs-Teilchen sind wie Menschen auf einer Wahlparty. Ginge ein Unbekannter durch den Raum, niemand würde sich umdrehen. Keine Aufmerksamkeit, keine Masse. Käme aber ein politisches Schwergewicht in den Raum, alle würden es bemerken. Viel Aufmerksamkeit, viel Gewicht. Das überzeugte auch Margaret Thatcher. Genauso funktioniert die Theorie. Die Histeilchen reagieren sensibel auf alles, was an ihnen vorbei passieren will. Das ganze Universum ist durchflutet von diesen Higgs-Teilchen. Sie sind alles andere als statisch und entstehen und vergehen ständig. Sie reagieren ganz verschieden, je nachdem, welcher Typ von den zwölf Elementarteilchen durch dieses Meer schwimmen will. Vier Beispiele. Ein Elektron etwa. Die Higgs-Teilchen bemerken es fast nicht. Es hat daher wenig Masse. Ein Myon dagegen ist schon attraktiver und damit auch etwas schwerer. Seine Masse ist rund 200 Mal größer. Nummer 3, ein W-Boson. Es ist noch einmal rund 750 Mal schwerer. Zum Schluss ein Top Quarks, eines von den insgesamt sechs Quarks. Es ist das schwerste von ihnen. Die Higgs-Teilchen reagieren massiv. Das Top Quarks hat noch einmal doppelt so viel Masse wie das W-Boson. So stellen sich die Elementarteilchenphysiker die Welt im Kleinsten vor. Und wenn die Theorie so stimmt, dann müssten Experimentatoren diese Higgs-Teilchen erzeugen können. Das zu vollbringen, das ist die Hauptaufgabe von CERN, vom Large Hadron Collider, LHC. LHC ist ein unterirdischer Ring von 27 Kilometern Länge. Dort werden Teilchen auf nahezu Lichtgeschwindigkeit beschleunigt und in einer direkten Kollision aufeinander geschossen. Die Theoretiker sagen voraus, wenn zwei Protonen mit nahezu Lichtgeschwindigkeit zusammenstoßen, dann sollte dabei ein Higgs-Teilchen erzeugt werden. Bedingung ist, es müssen genau zwei Protonen frontal zusammenstoßen. Mehr noch. 
Es müssen sich die Elementarbausteine der Protonen exakt treffen. Je eines der jeweils drei Quarks in einem Proton. Die Chance dazu ist ziemlich gering. Doch im Beschleuniger wird dieses Ereignis so oft wiederholt, dass es in wenigen Fällen auftreten muss. Und wie bei der Verkehrskontrolle wird dann ein Bild geblitzt, genau von diesem Ereignis. Dieses Higgs-Teilchen wird ganz schnell nach seinem Entstehen zerfallen. In bekannte Bausteine. Wie der Schmauch bei einer Pistole die Kugel verrät, so verrät sich das Higgs-Teilchen. Und erstmals wurden jetzt Hinweise auf so ein Higgs-Teilchen beobachtet. Für die CERN-Forscher eine Sensation. Scheint die Beobachtung doch erstmals zu bestätigen, was die Physiker schon immer vermutet hatten. Schlimm, wenn es nicht so gewesen wäre. Let's go to our correspondent Dan Bircher, who's uh, at a gathering of scientists in central London who've been reacting to the news there. Daniel. Yes, Tim, a lot of smiles on the faces of uh, researchers, scientists here uh, as that news began to filter through. The briefing from CERN still happening over my shoulder here, but uh, the key thing that we have learnt is that uh, researchers at CERN have found with a high degree of certainty a new particle with Higgs-like characteristics. They haven't yet pr proved that it is the Higgs. That is work that will now happen. There are two separate projects uh, which have been carrying out this work. One of them is CMS. It was designed uh, by Professor Professor Tajinda Verdi, who's also project manager for a while on that, uh, how significant is this today, even though it is couched in slightly cautious language? I think it's a historic moment, and it's a once-in-a-lifetime moment for people like me. So you have a big smile on your face. Yes, We I saw have. that here. A lot of people involved with the work, and also others that have no connection with it, but will learn a great deal from this, see this as a really key moment in, in physics and science. The LHC project has captured the imagination of uh, public in a manner which is very similar to the Apollo moonshot program so that gives you the uh, the amplitude of uh, what is happening now in the simple terms as it is possible to explain it why is the Higgs boson important in fact the world around us is characterized by a wonderful variety of phenomena and it's one of the remarkable achievements of 20th century science that many of these phenomena can be described in terms of uh, underlying principles of great simplicity and beauty. And these are in, embedded inside the standard model of particle physics. And the key uh, element that is missing in the standard model is the mechanism that gives mass to particles. We have particles of mass in our bodies. We wouldn't exist because everything would be traveling at the speed of light and we wouldn't form objects. So it goes, mass goes to the heart, uh, it gives sub universe substance if you wish. So uh, the, the theoretical physicists um, believed as long ago as half a century ago that something like this must exist. Now you, the experimental physicists, are coming very close to saying they were right. Yes, in fact, the, the, the experiments have been uh, uh, were designed by 20 years ago, so it's a culmination of that piece of work. Now, uh, as has been mentioned, the object looks like a standard model of uh, uh, boson, but we have to also make sure that it behaves like one, because the standard model predicts very precisely how it should behave, how many times it decays into one thing, how many times it decays into the other things, and so these are the measurements that we now have to make. Very briefly, what happens next? So we, we shall be making these kinds of measurements. We'll be taking more data. CERN has just announced that the run, the current run, has been prolonged by two to three months. So instead of doubling the data set we have got at the moment, we'll be looking for tripling the data set. So the, the precision with which we make these measurements will become much, much better. And we will be starting to tackle this question, is it really the Higgs uh, boson, standard model Higgs boson or not? Professor Verdi, thank you very much indeed. So, still a great deal of work to come over many, many years to find out the exact detail of how this particle behaves, what exactly it is, and whether it answers all those questions uh, that theoretical physicists uh, believed uh, were necessary uh, up to 50 years ago. Uh, but uh, for now, it is clear that this is a hugely significant moment, uh, even though they are just falling a little bit short of saying that uh, it, it is with absolute certainty what they have been li looking for, saying that it is a provisional result at the moment. Okay, Daniel Birch from Central London, thank you very much. And this is what they saw. Subatomic debris, including the decayed remains of what they say appears to be the Higgs boson, thereby proving its existence. But. The mysteries of the universe are not solved yet. Consider this. All those galaxies, planets, and stars, everything we can see, 
Well, they make up only 4% of the universe. There's still a lot more to discover. Finding the Higgs boson, the God particle, just opens another door. Atika Schubert, CNN, London. You stand. I am ready for the event. Science Museum of Virginia, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Oh, that's us? Okay. Uh, this is Rich Conti of the Science Museum of Virginia. How do you hear us? Hey, good afternoon. I hear you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the space station. All right. Thank you. Good morning. We've got a question for you. you ready? Hi, my name is Fernando. My question is, what inspired you to be an astronaut? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, when I was young, my grandfather would uh, show me old films of the Apollo missions and the people walking on the moon, and that kind of got me excited about space. Um, I really like reading science fiction, and all of these things just kind of sparked my imagination a little bit. and. Uh, you know, I dreamed about being an astronaut when I was a kid, and I saw that they were looking for some school teachers to become astronauts, so I thought I'd give it a try, and uh, luckily I was accepted, and here I am. It's kind of a dream come true. Okay, wonderful. Our next question. Uh, hola, mi nombre es Jesús. Uh, ¿Cómo se preparó usted para el vuelo espacial? Pues tenemos un entrenamiento que es difícil y fuerte y se dura como dos años y pico y tenemos que viajar a diferentes países como Rusia porque subimos aquí en una nave de Rusia y tenemos que viajar mucho y estudiar los sistemas de la estación. from Super Volunteer at the Science Museum, Drew. Drew, far away. Hello. Hi, my name is Drew. I have a question. Has your perspective on life changed since being on the space station and being able to view Earth and space from a different angle? And if so, how? Well, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure if my perspective changed. I think uh, since I was a kid, I've always appreciated the planet and that, you know, realized that we do need to take care of it. But being in space really solidified that. And when you're up here in space and you look out the window and you see the Earth kind of out there in space, you can really, really appreciate even more how fragile it is. And it really made me, makes me want to go back and let people know what I've seen and it's kind of made my my thoughts about the earth a little bit stronger and if I can just say one thing about that I really uh, you know would push everyone to to think about how we uh, utilize the resources of the planet because it's all we have all right great question great answer our next question buenos dias yo, yo me llamo Michael En el espacio, ¿cómo afecta la falta de gravedad en el cuerpo? Buenos días. Es increíble porque el cuerpo se adapta muy bien aquí en el espacio, pero como tú puedes ver, uh, los líquidos como la sangre y el agua del cuerpo se sube y es algo que tenemos como una presión en la, en la cabeza. Y también los músculos y el esqueleto se ponen un poquito flojo y tenemos que hacer ejercicios cada día. Estamos ahí en una bicicleta o, y, o estamos ahí corriendo y también le, levantando uh, pesas por como dos horas cada día. You, you, uh, Mike, you want to tell us what the question was in uh, English again? The question was, how does being in space how does the lack of gravity affect your um, human body? Okay, great. All right, so we're ready for our next question. Okay, ready to go? Okay. Hey, 
Okay, Joe, could you maybe give us a, that last answer in English as well, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, what I was saying is it's uh, amazing how easily the uh, human body adapts to being in space. But as you might be able to see in the video, a lot of the fluids in our bodies, like the blood and the water, they tend to rise up uh, in our head, so we feel a little bit of pressure. It's almost like uh, standing on your hands. Um, and also the bones and muscles, they tend to weaken while we're up here. So we do a lot of working out, uh, probably a couple hours every day, either riding on a stationary bike, uh, getting on a treadmill, and we have a machine that simulates lifting weights that's really good. So we got to spend a lot of time keeping our body strong so that we're uh, able to return to Earth and be able to, to perform when we get back home. Okay, outstanding. We're ready for our next question. Hi, my name is Dawood. I'm, I want to ask, when you are in a space, do the stars look the same as they do from Earth? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question one more time for me? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question one more time for me? Yeah. Do the stars look any different from space than they do from the Earth, Joe? Uh, okay. Um, you know, you can see a lot of stars out here, and it's pretty cool. So when it's nighttime, one of our favorite things to do, like even in the daytime, but at night, it's really cool going to the window we have and looking at the stars and there's just so many of them. If you imagine going out somewhere, if you've ever gone camping or somewhere where you don't have the city lights and you can see a lot of stars, we have that all the time. So you can really see them. They're really, really bright. Uh, they don't twinkle like they do on Earth because we don't have the atmosphere affecting them. And it's, uh, it's pretty cool to see the stars out here at night. Okay, next question. Um. Hello, my name is Christian, and my question is, how do you know if it is day or night? Hey, Christian, uh, luckily we, have, we do have some windows, and so if you're by a window, you can see if the sun is up or if it's set, but it's pretty neat because every, about every 45 minutes, the sun will come up, and then the sun will set 45 minutes later. So we go through a lot of day and night cycles, we also have a, a planner, kind of a calendar for our day, and on there it has different color bands so we can look at that if we're not by a window and you can see if it's daytime or not. Um, so most of the day while you're working, you know, the lights are on and so it doesn't make a whole lot of difference unless there's something you want to see outside. And if we're doing any operations like that, it is really important if it is daytime or nighttime outside. Okay, next question. Hi, my name is Freddie. Uh, what character traits do you think are needed to be a good astronaut? You know, that's a, that's a really good and a tough question because we do a lot of different things up here. And of course, to become an astronaut, you do need to study in the sciences, the technology, engineering, mathematics. So you need to have some kind of a background in that. Um, but we work as a team, so you don't have to be an expert in everything. But another quality that I'm finding as I live up here for a longer period of time is you really have to feel comfortable working with tools, working with your hands. So I think a good trait would be uh, someone who feels just as comfortable having a book in one hand and having a wrench in their other hand and being comfortable going back and forth between studying and also working with tools. Okay, wonderful. Next question. Hey, how are you? Um, my name's Sharon, and I have a question. What do you do when you first get to the International Space Station? Hey, Sharon, hello. Um, when you first get here, it's kind of like if you've ever moved before and you're getting to a new house, you want to get things in order. So one of the first things I wanted to do, we spent two days getting up here on a Russian vehicle, is I wanted to change my clothes, um, and then I wanted to set up my crew quarters where I sleep and I have my personal stuff. So we sleep in sleeping bags. I had to get that ready. I wanted to get my computer set up, 
and really I just wanted to float around and look at my new home and see where things are. So it's a lot like moving to a new place and it takes a few days to really get comfortable with your surroundings and know where everything's located. Okay, we have another question for you, Joe. Hi, my name is Dina. My question is, what do you do during an average day? Well, I'm not sure if uh, any day is really average up here. Uh, one of the cool things about being an astronaut up here is we do different things every day. Um, we do have to work out every day, so that's a, a little bit of time that we have set aside. Um, but, for example, today I was working on our toilet, um, so we have to do a lot of maintenance up here. I was replacing some parts. Um, a little bit later, we're going to have a simulation uh, to practice any kind of emergencies we might have. Uh, there'll be a little bit of science that I'll do later. So every day is different, which is cool. And you never know what you're going to get, and you keep going from one thing to another. Uh, so they keep us on our toes up here. All righty. Hi, my name is Etisham. Some people think science is difficult. What would you tell them? Sorry, can you repeat that for me? Sorry, can you repeat that for me? Joe, for the folks that say science is difficult, what would you tell them? Well, I would tell them I think science is fun and science is cool. If you were to see some of the things we're doing up here, um, I think you might change your mind a little bit about science if you think it's really difficult. Um, I was just working with, uh, with some fire up here uh, on a science experiment someone's doing, and some things might be difficult, but like anything in life, some things that are difficult, if you really, really enjoy it, it's not as painful to practice and get better at it. So if you're somebody who thinks science is difficult, I would just say, hey, practice a little bit more, study a little bit more, and I think you're going to find it's really fun and it helps you kind of explain a lot of things that are happening around us, which is what science is. And if you can follow along with some of the things that we're doing up here, I think you'll agree that it's, uh, it's pretty cool. All right, we agree science is cool. Next question. Hi, my name is Rajin. My question is, what do you miss most while you are in space? What do I miss most when I'm in space? Yes. Well, I think, uh, you know, this is summertime, and yesterday was, of course, the 4th of July, and I get all these emails from my friends and my family that, hey, we're at the beach or we're at the park and we're enjoying a beautiful day. So I think uh, the one thing I miss is really the weather on Earth, you know, being outside, being able to feel the sun on my body, uh, to feel the wind. So I, I think I really miss that. Of course, I miss my family. Um, but uh, just enjoying Earth for what it is and just feeling the climate is something I look forward to when I get back. Okay, great. Next question. Hi, my name is Rhonda. Um, my question is, what is your favorite thing to do in space? Hello. Um, everything in space is fun. and But I think there's two things that we can do in space that you really can't do on Earth. One of them is float. Um, so you can fly. When I was a kid, I used to imagine being, you know, either Superman or Spider-Man so I can you know, here I can hang on the wall. And so those are things you can't do on Earth, and that's pretty neat. And the second one is probably looking out the windows and looking at Earth. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful views when I'm at home on Earth. You can go to a mountain and you can look out on a valley. But the view we have up here is pretty unique. So the two things I enjoy most are floating around, enjoying that, and then looking out the window and appreciating the beautiful Earth we live on. Okay, our next question. 
Hi, my name is Carlos, and my question is, are you working on any special projects while on the International Space Station? Hey, Carlos. Um, well, a lot of, I mean, almost everything we do up here is uh, pretty special. And coming up soon in a few weeks, we have a uh, Japanese cargo vehicle that will be coming to the uh, space station that we have to uh, grab and attach to the space station. And then we have a couple of spacewalks coming up. So those are pretty special times uh, during my mission. And personally, one thing that I wanted to do while I was here is I wanted to keep a journal of what I'm doing every day. So I try to write a little bit. Um, when you're up here sometimes, it, it almost seems like a dream. And after my shuttle flight, you know, sometimes you look back and did that really happen? And so I really wanted to, you know, take notes and write things down that are happening here every day so I can remember those things. And when I come back, I can share them with people. And I think, you know, keeping a journal, it's a cool thing because you'll write stuff down that you feel today. And it's pretty neat to look back at that in a few years and, and see what you were thinking at that point in your life. Okay, we have another question for you. Hola, me llamo José y mi pregunta es, ¿cuáles son las cosas que le gustan más de su trabajo? Hey, and my question hey, is, Jose, what, mi nombre uh, también. what do you like most about your job? Mi tocayo, Jose. Um, pues, Jose, como yo dije antes, cada día estamos haciendo algo diferente. Por supuesto, uh, el tiempo que estoy aquí en el espacio es muy divertido y es la parte que uh, nos gusta uh, como más, pero es una parte pequeña de nuestro trabajo. Y me gusta trabajar como un equipo um, y me gusta que cada día es algo diferente. Y como dije, es fuerte, pero me gusta hacerlo y no es como un trabajo. And so my answer was, uh, of course, we like being in space. That's one of the best parts about, about our job. But really, that's a small part of what we do as astronauts. But what I really like is that every day we're doing something different. And it's, uh, it's fun, it's exciting, and sometimes it's difficult. But when you really enjoy it, those things that are difficult, they don't really seem like work. So, you know, I say I'm going to work every day, but it's, uh, it's a lot more like having a great time. Okay, Joe, we're entering the rapid fire round. We got three quick ones for you. Can you tell us how long you've been on the station, what you had for breakfast, and describe what's behind you? Okay, I've been in space uh, coming up on maybe two months. Uh, for breakfast, I had some uh, oatmeal with raisins and some peaches and a cup of coffee. And behind me, um, I'm in the lab right now, so behind me we have uh, one of the nodes where we eat. And if you keep going back behind me, you'll run into the Russian segment of the space station. Joe, the audience wants to know if you can go into the Russian part. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we, we call this the, uh, you know, the U.S. operating system side, and we call it the Russian side. But really, you know, it's uh, one space station. We work together um, throughout our missions. Uh, some of the Russians will sleep here in our crew quarters. And so you don't need a visa to go back and forth from one side to the other. But we spend most of our days apart just because we specialize in the equipment in our different uh, segments of the space station. But really, we're one big team working together. And if my extension cord was long enough and I could take the camera, I could fly you over there. So maybe we can do that another day. Joe, we have just about uh, 30 seconds, and you've got a, an audience of young people who have really been inspired by your talk. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us before you uh, zip by overhead? Well, I'd just like to tell them, you know, thanks for uh, joining me today. I'm very excited that you're uh, showing an interest in the sciences 
And the one thing I would say is don't be afraid to dream big. Don't let people bring you down and tell you you can't do it because dreams can come true. They're hard and you do have to work hard. They're not just going to happen. But when you have an opportunity, you know, take that and go after what you want. Um, you're, you know, you got your whole life ahead of you. So work hard and do what you want to do, but make sure you have fun while you're doing it. All right, can we all give Joe a big cheer and Tom, thank you. And Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, Science Museum of Virginia. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Copy. Good day from NASA's Johnson Space Center. This is Mission Control Houston. You're looking at the International Space Station Flight Control Room on this Thursday, July 5th, 2012, as a team of flight controllers watches over the shoulders of a uh, orbiting crew aboard the International Space Station. The commander of the crew in the center is Gennady Padalka. He is on his fourth flight into space and his fourth flight as a commander of uh, that spacecraft as well. Once aboard the space station Mir, the Russian space station, and now three times as an expedition crew commander, both uh, Expedition 9, Expedition 19, and now Expedition 32. He's joined by a first-time flyer from uh, Russia as a cosmonaut is on the left in this view is Sergei Revin, and on the right, is uh, U.S. astronaut Joe Acaba on his second flight into space, his first as a long-duration crew member. He flew uh, as a member of the STS-119 uh, crew, which is uh, Station Assembly Flight 15A, which flew uh, back in March of 2009. Following an off-duty day uh, Wednesday, the uh, crew of Expedition 32 is back at work. They're performing experiment checks throughout the day, maintenance, and some routine housekeeping chores. They're also uh, in the midst of taking part in a training exercise to practice initial crew actions in response to specific emergency cases. Early in his day, Akaba performed an in-flight maintenance procedure on the water uh, hygiene compartment aboard the International Space Station. Prior to the uh, training exercise that's ongoing now, Akaba uh, floated in for a conversation about life aboard the station with students at the Science Museum of Virginia in Richmond as part of NASA's Summer of Innovation program. His Russian colleagues assisted uh, where necessary with the maintenance activity. And they also documented the oceans as part of an experiment to periodically photograph color contrasts and shapes along the ocean's surface. That data can improve determination of productive fishing locations at various times of the year. The crew also continues uh, preparatory work on board for the arrival of three new crew members in about 10 days. Uh, the new crew members, uh, Yuri Malenchenko, Sonny Williams, and Akihiko Hoshide are at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan on uh, Wednesday. Uh, they attended uh, a traditional flag raising ceremony outside the Cosmonaut Hotel in Baikonur. The American, uh, Japanese, Russian, and Kazakh flags were raised as part of that ceremony. Today, Thursday, Williams, Malenchenko, and Hoshide spent the day reviewing their flight plan in preparation for their uh, launch to the International Space Station, which begins with uh, a launch on their Soyuz rocket at 9.40 p.m. Central Time on Saturday, July 14th. So it's another busy day on board the International Space Station for Expedition 32 as they continue through their 50th day aboard the station and their 52nd day in space. We're live at the Guyana Space Centre for the launch of an Ariane 5 ECA. We're orbiting two passengers today, Echo Star 17 for Hughes and MSG3 for Umitsat. Welcome if you are just joining us. Our very best wishes to our customers and to everybody who's worked so hard to bring us to today's launch.
à tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, unité, top, allumage moteur Vulcain. Allumage Vulcain. Top, allumage EAP, décollage. Top, c'est bon. manœuvre d'orientation du lanceur. Les paramètres à bord sont normaux, la trajectoire est nominale. And there she goes, hauling herself against the gravity of the Earth. We've rotated to the east, we're heading out over the Atlantic. We're burning three engines, the Vulcan, which uh, we did light on the ground, but actually it's those two boosters which are doing all the work here. In fact, their job's really to get us away from the gravity of the Earth, isn't it? Yes, the boosters are providing 90% of a thrust right now, and each boost is burning two tons of propellant per second. To give you an idea, if you fill your car once a week, that's how much gas you'd use in a year. And we're just hearing it. We're 15 kilometers from the pad, Simon. We're just getting the sound of uh, the launcher as it flies over. In fact, we can even feel the vibrations, can't we? It does oh. take a little while for the sound to get you, though, doesn't it? Well, like you say, 15 kilometers from a pad, but we do feel it. And of course, those in launch control, they too will certainly be feeling this. Uh, it's quite sensational. What's it like for the satellites in there? They too will be feeling some dynamics right now. They get acoustic vibrations at launch, we flood the pad with water to dampen this effect, and then they get another round of acoustics as we pass through the sound barrier. Though the satellites are very well prepared for this, it's all part of a plan. We're very lucky tonight. We are having beautiful clear skies. Uh, we uh, could have had a few clouds, but we haven't. So we're getting these phenomenal images of Ariane as she flies through that uh, what looks like a blue blue sky heading into space and here on the left hand side of the screen you can see the trajectory just talk us through that briefly yes uh, the curve this is a computer simulation of the actual trajectory the white dot on the curve that's the actual position of the launch vehicle right now the v means the velocity and the A means the altitude. Now we can see those boosters separating and um, heading back down to Earth. Basically, they've burnt all their fuel. We don't need them anymore. And there they are. We're losing weight. Yes, we've lost about three quarters of our weight, in fact, in just over the two minutes. The lighter we are, the more efficient we are, and the faster we can go. Absolutely, and that's why we jettison parts throughout the flight once we no longer need them. So now the main stage is doing all the work. We can see it. That's the dot in the middle of the, uh, the two boosters there. That's right. It's a huge tank of cryogenic propellant, and it's going to burn for nine minutes in total. And the fairing is the structure that we saw uh, earlier at the top of the vehicle, which is protecting the satellites from the rigors of uh, the launch. Uh, one of those, of course, we haven't mentioned is uh, friction. Indeed, and yes, the launch is flying through our dense atmosphere at a very high speed. And we can, uh, we're getting confirmation now that the uh, fairing has separated. Uh, the fairing is, uh, we're effectively technically in space, and you can see it, they're falling in two parts back down to Earth. We don't need it anymore because, of course, there's no friction in space. Indeed, yes. The atmosphere is about 100 kilometers uh, deep. Any remaining gas up there, it's so thin, the satellites are now safe from the effects of the atmosphere. And there we go. We can see our two passengers for the first time. That's Echo Star 17 at the front, and MSG3 is behind, but we can't actually see it yet. No, that's right. It's hidden underneath our black structure, what we call the cylinder, and it's designed especially to enable Ariane to launch two satellites at the same time. And this year, the Ariane Space family of launches has grown to three. It's been busy times at Ariane Space. In May, it was mission accomplished once again for Ariane 5. When she successfully launched JCSAT-13 for Japan and Venusat-2 for Vietnam, Ariane Space has now launched over 300 satellites from the Kiana Space Center. The next Soyuz launch vehicle from CSG is now taking shape, ready for an autumn launch. It'll carry two more Galileo satellites for Europe's navigation program. They'll join the first pair, which Ariane Space launched during the maiden flight of Soyuz from CSG last October. 
Wetter, 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 das gibt's immer. Zuverlässig, aber zuverlässige Wettervorhersagen nicht, schon gar nicht ohne Satelliten, die hübsche Bilder liefern. Damit die so genau wie möglich sind, fliegt gerade der neueste Wettersatellit MSG3 an seinen Arbeitsplatz. Wenn man sich vorstellt, dass da die, der Apfel die Erde ist, dann wird der Satellit so stationiert, dass er genau über dem Äquator sich mit genau der gleichen Geschwindigkeit dreht, äh, um äh, die Erde, wie die Erde sich dreht. Also dadurch können wir vom Satelliten aus immer die gleiche ne, Fläche beobachten, nämlich Europa in dem Fall, und können alle 15 Minuten von Europa ein Bild haben. MSG3 besteht aus einem mit Solarzellen bestückten, trommelförmigen Körper. 2,30 Meter lang, 3,20 Meter Durchmesser. Vollgestopft mit Hightech-Sensoren. Kosten rund 130 Millionen Euro. Dafür liefert er eine Datenflut. Das ist äh, das Gute an diesem Satelliten, der übrigens der beste seiner Art immer noch ist, der weltweit operationell betrieben wird. Wir haben zwölf Spektralkanäle, also Bereiche, in denen der Satellit die Erde abtastet. Zwölf verschiedene Bilder, die ganz unterschiedliche Dinge zeigen. Wind, Wolken, darin Eis- oder Wassertropfen, deren Größe und ihre Veränderung. Besonders wichtig ist diese Information bei Unwettersituationen, wie wir sie auch in den kommenden Tagen wieder erleben werden. Dann kann man sehr zeitnah genau verfolgen, wie sich Gewitterzellen entwickeln, wie sie ziehen und kann dann sehr exakte kurzfristige Wetterprognosen abliefern. Je detaillierter die Daten, umso zuverlässiger die Vorhersagen. MSG3 muss noch zehn Tage durchs All fliegen, bis er seine Beobachtungsposition in 36.000 Kilometern Höhe erreicht hat. Ja, Unwetter haben vielen Menschen in der Nacht erneut den Schlaf geraubt. Sommergewitter haben Polizei und Feuerwehren in Atem gehalten. Tausende Notrufe gingen ein, ebenso viele Einsatzkräfte kümmerten sich bis in die Morgenstunden um überflutete Straßen und entwurzelte Bäume. Betroffen waren vor allem Teile Nordrhein-Westfalens und der Südosten der Republik. Eine Winterlandschaft Anfang Juli im bayerischen Kochel am See. Hagelschauer auch in Brandenburg und besonders schlimm in Sachsen. In Polditz zerschlugen Golfballgroße Eisklumpen sämtliche Dächer. Na, hier sieht es aus wie ein Schweizer Käse. Auch die Kirchenfenster sind fast alle zerstört. In anderen Landesteilen wie hier in Dresden waren es die Wassermassen, die Straßenbahnen zum Stehen brachten und etliche Keller verlaufen ließen. Verzweiflung bei den Bewohnern in Kavertitz. Mit Sandsäcken versuchten sie ihre Häuser vergeblich zu schützen. Wie geht's jetzt weiter? Das weiß ich nicht. Versicherung muss ich morgen früh anrufen. Wie es nur weitergeht. Arbeit. Arbeit, Arbeit. Neben Hagel und Regen waren es die Blitze, die gefährlich wurden. Diesem Haus in Berbisdorf sieht man den Blitzeinschlag von außen zwar nicht an, aber der Stromschlag schoss durch die Elektroleitungen und setzte das Obergeschoss in Brand. Und als wäre das alles nicht schon Naturgewalt genug, entwurzelten die starken Sturmböen mehrere Bäume. Entwarnung gibt es für heute übrigens nicht. Die nächsten Sommergewitter sind bereits angekündigt. Was für ein Sommer, fragen wir doch ja. nach bei Björn. Welche Region trifft es da am stärksten? Ja, in der Zukunft, also in den nächsten ja. Stunden, vor allen Dingen den Südosten unseres Landes, aber auch in der breiten Mitte, ganz neuerlich Schauer und Gewitter geben mit Unwetterpotenzial. Zuerst einmal der Blick 24 Stunden zurück und da sehen Sie es auf der Radaranimation, wie die Gewitterzellen dann in Richtung Norden gezogen sind. In der Fläche, in den stärksten Zellen sind durchaus mal 50 bis 90 Liter Regen pro Quadratmeter zusammengekommen und das ist eben mehr als ein ganzer Monat. Niederschlag. Tja, und die Temperaturen heute, die zeigen auch, vor allen Dingen im Osten wird es noch mal sehr heiß, sehr schwül. Das Wasseräquivalent in der Luft, also die Wassermenge, die dort rauskommen kann, ist sehr hoch und dementsprechend ist auch das Unwetterpotenzial vor allen Dingen in den östlichen Landesteilen und im Südosten sehr hoch. Dort kann mitunter neuerlich Starkregen bzw. große Hagel- und Sturmböen aufkommen, gelb eingefärbt. Das sind die Bereiche, in denen das Unwetterpotenzial hoch ist und ganz im Westen, da ist die Unwettergefahr schon durch. Ja, und auch am Wochenende wird es zwar noch Schauer und Gewitter geben. Insgesamt wird es aber ruhiger weitergehen. Also leichte Entwarnung. Vielen Dank, Björn. Sommer in Chicago. Und was für einer. Fast 40 Grad Celsius. Ein neuer Hitzerekord, der nur so hier zu ertragen ist. Und die Meteorologen sehen für die nächsten Tage keine Anzeichen für eine Abkühlung. Vom mittleren Westen bis zum Atlantik wird mit neuen Höchsttemperaturen gerechnet. Sogar die Highways geben den Geist auf. Unter der Hitze bricht der Asphalt, Straßen sind unpassierbar. Von Wisconsin nach Texas, überall passiert das. 
Auf Wahlkampfrunde in Ohio kam auch der Präsident höchst selbst ins Schwitzen. Und für die Hauptstadt ist für das Wochenende sogar ein Hitzerekord von 41 Grad vorausgesagt. Nach den schweren Stürmen, vor allem in Virginia, Ohio und Illinois, sind immer noch Hunderttausende auch nach fast einer Woche ohne Strom. Das heißt ohne Airconditioner. Dagegen konnten die Waldbrände in Wyoming und Colorado eingedämmt werden. In Montana dagegen loderten die Flammen erneut auf. Frühestens nächste Woche dürfen die Amerikaner auf etwas Abkühlung hoffen. Bis dahin heißt es, Eis ran schaffen, Wasser anzapfen und irgendwie das Beste draus machen. In Bayern wurden 15 Wanderer nach einem Blitz einen Schlag verletzt. Und genauso wie in Bayern zerstörten auch in Sachsen Golfball große Hagelkörner, Autos und Fensterscheiben. Ein Haus geriet in Brand, Bäume knickten um und vielerorts liefen die Keller voll. Nina Lenhoff mit den Bildern. Rettungskräfte versorgen die Wanderer und Mitglieder des niederländischen Militärs bei Schönau am Königssee. Sie alle waren von dem Gewitter überrascht worden, unter den Verletzten ein zehnjähriges Kind. Erneut Unwetter über Deutschland. Erst gestern sahen viele Straßen so oder so aus. Hier in Schledorf in Bayern gab es Winterimpressionen mitten im Sommer. Riesige Hagelkörner kamen vom Himmel. Das ist also beängstigend gewesen, weil du nicht gewusst hast, hin irgendwelche Fenster oder nicht. Da sind fast alle Dachfenster kaputt. Auch in Polditz in Sachsen wüteten Hagelstürme. Der Schuppen dieses Bewohners sieht aus wie ein Schweizer Käse. Das ist mein Auto und das waren die Hagelkörner. Die haben ähm, die Frontscheibe zerstört. Ringsrum alles voller Beulen. Hier vorne sehen sie also, es ist eine Schande. Nun hoffen die Autobesitzer auf ihre Versicherung. Wenn jemand durch ein Unwetter einen Hagelschaden am Auto hat, dann bekommt ihn jeder ersetzt, der entweder eine Teilkasko- oder eine Vollkaskoversicherung hat. Bei dieser Familie in Berbesdorf nahe Dresden schlug der Blitz ein. Normalerweise trägt die Hausrat- oder Gebäudeversicherung den Schaden, auch wenn kein Blitzableiter vorhanden ist. Den Osten Deutschlands erwischte es besonders heftig. Örtlich fielen bis zu 60 Liter Regen pro Quadratmeter, so viel wie sonst im ganzen Juli. Vor allem hier erwarten Meteorologen weitere Unwetter. Gerade erreichen uns diese Bilder aus Königswalde. Hier stehen inzwischen weite Teile des Ortes unter Wasser. This is a view of the International Space Station uh, flight control room as a team of flight controllers watches over all of the uh, station systems throughout the week. The uh, flight director for most of the week has been uh, Mike Serafin. He served as one of the three flight directors that watched over the team uh, each day uh, throughout the week. All of the uh, uh, space station uh, activities have been going very smoothly on board as the station circles the Earth every uh, 92 minutes from an altitude of 248 statute miles. The uh, crew on board, Expedition 32, Commander Gennady Padalka, Flight Engineer Sergei Revin, and Flight Engineer Joe Acaba are in their um, 51st day aboard the station and 53rd day in space. It's been a busy week for the three crew members as they uh, spent their first week alone following the return to Earth last Sunday of Expedition 31's Oleg Kononenko, Andrei Kuipers, and Don Pettit after 193 days in space. Kononenko returned to his home in Star City outside Moscow, and Kuipers, Kuipers and Pettit returned to Houston. All three have begun post-flight medical checkups and rehabilitation back to the one-gravity environment of Earth. Monday, uh, Akaba performed a communications test of the onboard smartphone associated with the synchronized position hold, engage, reorient experimental satellites or spheres. He'll conduct operations with that experiment next week. Tuesday, Akaba worked uh, with some of the ongoing experiments and inspected some of the exercise equipment on board as well. He worked with the burning and suppression of solids experiment or bass experiment, observing and then reconfiguring the uh, binary colloid alloy test uh, experiment or BCAT. He also inspected the uh, resistive exercise uh, device rope for damage and connected external hard drives to the station support computer laptops so that the hard drives can be reconfigured by the ground for the arriving astronauts of the Expedition 32 and 33 crew, Sonny Williams and Aki Hoshide. Throughout the week, Commander Gennady Padalka and Flight Engineer Sergei Revin worked in the Russian segment, taking inventory, packing the Progress and ATV vehicles for departure, and conducted experiments studying the Earth's environment, designed to document changes that occur over long periods of time, as well as captured data to determine productive fishing locations at various times of the year. 
Thursday before joining his other two crewmates for an onboard training exercise to demonstrate the crew's and flight control team's ability to respond to an emergency depressurization. Acaba met uh, long distance with students located at the Science Museum of Virginia in Richmond as part of NASA's Summer of Innovation program. He talked about life and work aboard the station and the importance of education and reaching goals. Friday was spent mostly with packing and inventory activities and some household maintenance along with autonomous experiment checks and tagging up with flight control teams and managers around the world. This weekend, the crew will essentially be off duty, but will conduct routine housekeeping chores, exercise, and check on some autonomous payloads and ensure that they're operating properly. They'll also have an opportunity to talk with their family and friends back here on Earth. Next week, the crew prepares the station for the arrival of the next three crew members. Yuri Malenchenko, Sonny Williams, and Aki Hoshide are preparing for their launch to the station scheduled for Saturday, July 14th, arriving on uh, Tuesday, July 17th. Well, is everybody ready? Okay, let's go. In Star City, Russia, at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center, Expedition 32 crew members cosmonaut Yuri Malenchenko, NASA astronaut Sonny Williams, and Akihiko Hoshide of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency participated in traditional ceremonies in advance of their mid-July launch to the station. Malenchenko, Williams, and Hoshide will complete their training at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Upon their arrival to the space station, the trio will join ISS Commander Gennady Padalka, NASA astronaut Joe Akaba, and cosmonaut Sergei Revin, the other three members of Expedition 32. Today, NASA and Kennedy Space Center are again lifting our sights and lifting our spirit to new heights. The first Orion spacecraft destined for orbit arrived at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida to begin processing for a flight test in 2014. The flight test, called Exploration Flight Test 1, or EFT-1, will not carry any people into space during the mission. Instead, it will be loaded with a wide variety of instruments to evaluate how it behaves during launch, in the vacuum of space, and through the searing heat of re-entry. Later Orion spacecraft will take astronauts far beyond Earth on missions to an asteroid, the Moon, and perhaps even Mars. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to Mars. We know that the Orion capsule is a critical part of the system that is going to take us there. And so we're working on it. For now though, all attention is focused on completing the assembly of this Orion. The work will take place in the Operations and Checkout Building at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Refurbished extensively in 2006, the high bay at the ONC has been outfitted with large fixtures and tooling to turn the aluminum shell of Orion into a functioning spacecraft complete with avionics, instrumentation, and the heat shield. A Delta IV heavy rocket from United Launch Alliance will lift the capsule into an orbit reaching 3,600 miles, about 15 times higher than the International Space Station. The mission will last only a few hours long enough to make two orbits before being sent plunging back into the atmosphere and parachuting safely into the ocean. The EFT-1 exercise in 2014 will also be the first opportunity for the Space Launch System program to check out a new and versatile piece of flight hardware. The massive aluminum adapter rings being built by engineers at the Marshall Space Flight Center will be used to connect Orion to the Delta IV rocket used to power the EFT-1 flight. But the same design will also be used on Space Launch System flights. The adapter rings are being designed once for both applications as part of NASA's aggressive pursuit of affordable solutions for the human exploration of space. A lot of programs take years and years, and for us to have the opportunity to build the first piece of SLS flight hardware and provide it to another program, that's exciting. The first flight test of the full-scale SLS is planned for 2017. Students and educators from across the country experienced what it's like to be a rocket scientist during Rocket Week at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility. 
More than 100 participants received hands-on training in building payloads for spaceflight, learned the basics of rocketry, and developed activities for the classroom through the fifth annual Rock On workshop for university-level participants and the concurrent second annual Wallops Rocket Academy for Teachers and Students, or RATS, program. In addition to nine workshop-built experiments, eight custom-built experiments flew on a NASA Terrier-improved sounding rocket inside a payload canister known as Rocksat C. These experiments were developed at universities that previously participated in a Rock On workshop. Rock On and RATS provide a unique experience for students, faculty, and teachers to understand the importance of a sounding rocket suborbital launch and the value of science that's collected. Both opportunities demonstrate the practical application of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Images captured by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory show some pre-4th of July fireworks in the sun's southern hemisphere. SDO spotted an M5.6 class solar flare eruption from active region 1515. The solar flare was accompanied by a coronal mass ejection which hurled a cloud of plasma into space. A portion of the CME, which was not Earth-directed, did not have the velocity needed to escape the sun's gravity and was pulled back to the surface. It may have been hot, but Goddard employees and their families couldn't stay away from the center's annual Celebrate Goddard Day. It was a chance for the Goddard community to celebrate the challenging work and the diverse workforce at the center. Goddard directorates, advisory committees, and clubs provided tours of their facilities and their exhibits in an effort to give employees an opportunity to learn more about the wide range of projects and programs currently being worked on at Goddard as well as upcoming missions and science projects. Ames Research Center opened its doors to more than 1,000 visitors during Family Day. The guests learned about some of the science and technologies being developed at the center, such as telerobotics, which allows humans and robots to work together in space. They were also introduced to the world's largest wind tunnel and the vertical motion simulator, which was used to train astronauts to fly the space shuttle. Physics and science were also showcased at the Ames Exploration Encounter, a hands-on learning environment located inside a former supersonic wind tunnel building. Ah! One, zero, and liftoff, the final liftoff of Atlantis. On the shore. One year ago, on July 8, 2011, an estimated one million spectators braved the balmy Florida temperatures. Fantastic. Go! Great to watch Space Shuttle Atlantis rise skyward from the Kennedy Space Center to begin STS-135, the final space shuttle mission. The crew of four veteran astronauts on board Atlantis, Commander Chris Ferguson, Pilot Doug Hurley, and mission specialists Sandy Magnus and Rex Walheim set off to deliver a stockpile of supplies and parts to the station. On-orbit highlights of the mission included a call from President Obama during which he acknowledged the significance of the mission. There have been thousands who've poured their hearts and souls into America's space shuttle program over the last three decades that are following this journey with special interest. Uh, and to them and all the men and women of NASA, I want to say thank you. And the delivery to the ISS of a U.S. flag flown on SDS-1, the very first space shuttle mission. Thirteen days later, Atlantis and her crew returned to Earth, bringing to an end the 30-year space shuttle program. And 50 years ago, on July 10, 1962, NASA launched a Delta rocket from Cape Canaveral carrying the Telstar-1 satellite, the world's first commercial telecommunications satellite. The AT&T satellite relayed its first non-public television pictures a flag outside Andover Earth Station in Maine to France on July 11, 1962. Almost two weeks later, it relayed the first publicly available live transatlantic television signal, a broadcast that featured a speech by President John F. Kennedy. Telstar communication satellite. Telstar 1 also relayed the first telephone call to be transmitted through space. Telstar 1 went out of service in February 1963. And the NASA family is mourning the loss of retired astronaut Alan Poindexter, who died on July 1st 
following a jet ski accident in Little Sabine Bay at Pensacola Beach, Florida. Selected as an NASA astronaut in June 1998, Poindexter, a captain in the U.S. Navy, flew on two space shuttle missions. He was the pilot of Atlantis on STS-122 in 2008, and in 2010 served as commander on board Discovery during STS-131. He is survived by his wife and two sons. Poindexter was 50 years old. <laughs>